Moses. Call the meeting of the City Council Finance Committee to order for Monday evening, March 16, 2015. It's 6.30, 3 or 4 p.m., I believe it is, whichever one you want to use, Madam Clerk. In any case, just before we uh, begin, just a couple of quick things just for housekeeping purposes. Uh, the mayor did contact me this afternoon and said that he would be unable to attend this evening. He's attending an opium addiction um, uh, working group uh, session. He was appointed by Governor Baker to be on that committee, and he is in Boston this evening. Delt said he would be back in time, so he wanted me to make sure of that, and he also wanted me to indicate um, if there are other items that do have his name on them, that if there's questions and concerns, we can always postpone them if we really need an answer from the mayor. And he also wanted to make sure that I did mention that he definitely supports item number eight, which is for the naming of the uh, municipal building after the, uh, the late Mayor Paul V. Studinsky. He is wholeheartedly in support of that, so I do want to mention that now. Uh, also received a message uh, this evening from uh, uh, Mrs. DiNapoli indicating the Council of DiNapoli is under the weather and he's unable to attend and be here with us um, this evening. So those couple of quick items there. And I also believe there's a couple other people uh, when we get to the items that are unable to attend as well. But we will get back um, to that. So that being said, um, Madam Clerk, we're going to start with item number one. Communication from the city solicitor submitting copies of the following documents. One, settlement agreement, <coughs> Brockton Power, LLC, et al. versus City of Brockton, 12-11047-LTS. Two, agreement for the sale of AWRF affluent. Three, a copy of the concessions obtained in the matter of Brockton Power Company, LLC, docket number 2011-025. Settlement documentation to be submitted by council of record. Deciding will be discussed in executive session. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. I hereby make a motion to go to executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, MGL Chapter 30A, which is Section 21, 21 Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to the pending litigation involving Brockton Power v. City of Brockton et al. Case as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the City Council. Second. Second. Form of a motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded that we go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 38, Section 21.3 to discuss strategy with respect to pending litigation involving the Brockton Power versus City of Brockton, <laughs> ETAL case as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the City Council. The motion has been made properly and second and requires a roll call vote. As Chair, I hereby declare that having the discussion in open session may be detrimental to the public's body bargaining or litigation uh, position. Um, and I would also note that once we take roll call, uh, that the committee will convene in an open session after the executive session. So with that being said, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Shirley Azak. Yes. Shana Barnes. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Ianeri. Yes. Moses Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. Yes. Paul Studensky. Yes. Robert Sullivan. Yes. All nays. Motion, One, two, three, four. motion has been approved to go into executive session. Again, we will be uh, coming out. Uh, hopefully, we will not be long, but we will be returning to the public. Counselor to the session room, please. Okay. Finance committee meeting is back uh, in session. Council Sullivan. I'm going to make a motion to postpone agenda item number one to sometime in April. Second. Second. Motion has been made and second that we postpone item number one till sometime in April. All in favor of that? Opposed? Sometime in April is when we'll hear that one again. Um, Madam uh, Councilor Cruz. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we take item uh, number eight out of order. Second. Motion we made and second that we take uh, number eight out of order. All in favor of that? Opposed? We will take uh, number eight out of order. <laughs> Councilor Cruz. Uh, did you want to read the order? I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, read, read the item first. Order that the city hereby names the municipal building located at 60 Crescent Street as the Paul V. Studensky Municipal Building. Invited Paul Studensky and members of the Studensky family. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I file this, and I know many of my co uh, colleagues have signed on to this. Uh, I've been around politics and government in the city for uh, most of my life, and I'm almost 60. And the inspiration for a lot of us to, to serve came from Paul V. Studensky, uh, the father, whose picture is up here on the wall. Um, it, uh, we, in a conversation not too long ago, we realized there, there's no fitting memorial to, to uh, the former mayor. Uh, and I think the public doesn't know that some of the items about uh, Paul Studensky, he was the youngest elected official in the city at the time when he was 20, Paul, 24 years old? Yeah. 24 years old. Um, 
in effect, I can't believe he wasn't bald by the time he was 30, but uh, <laughs> um, he, was, he served as a state rep, served the people of Brockton for state rep, served as a mayor of this city in probably the toughest financial times, the uh, inception of Proposition 2.5 when it was probably the darkest days of the city, and he did a great job trying to lead the, lead the city through there. And uh, when we recently uh, acquired the building right outside of here where the uh, Board of Health is, uh, occupies and the uh, parent uh, advisory, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, Parent Information Center is there. Uh, it seemed like a great opportunity. You know, our, our colleagues on the school side have all these school buildings to name people after. We don't have an opportunity very often on the city side to mm -hmm. uh, honor somebody the way we have. Um, and I thought it would be fitting, and uh, I think to maybe say a few words, I think the only living counselor, uh, former counselor that served with Paul Studensky, Councilor Tom Brophy, who's a col who was a colleague, and uh, you the same age as Councilor Bro uh, Studensky would have been? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was, he's going to give us a few words about what it was like to serve with Paul. If there's no objections, because he was not Counselor, on the agenda. Councilor, you want to take your old seat? I think Councilor uh, <coughs> Studensky is right there looking over you. He kept you in line. I'm surprised he, he made it up there. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Cruz, members of the council. It's good to be, it's my first time back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be seen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, good to be back uh, go. in the council. I had to catch myself when you did just... Uh, um, uh, called the vote, almost raising my hand there, all those in favor. Uh, every once in a while, i got to catch myself doing that. You were never uh, in favor of anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I ran into Councilor Cruz the other night, and he had mentioned that um, uh, the order before the city council to name the, uh, the new building, the old Crescent Credit building, after uh, a former mayor, uh, former state rep. Uh, he was council president, I believe, um, six times, Paul Stadinsky, and I thought it would be a very fitting tribute to, uh, to Paul. Uh, although I, I will relay a story, um, I don't know if he really thought that much about naming, uh, the idea of naming things after people. One time uh, he was chairman of the real estate committee and we were renaming a street after a prominent Brocktonian and he he was, I don't know if that's a good idea. We should be naming streets. It was a, it was a well-known street in the city, and I think he, he more wanted to keep it as the old name than to change it. But he said, I don't think it's a, all that great an idea to name after uh, uh, people. He, and he said to me, you, Councilor Brophy, what if they name a street after you? And my response was, Mr. Chairman, if they do, make sure it's a one-way street. <laughs> so, but um, he, he, uh, he served the city in many capacities. I was fortunate enough uh, to uh, have served with him for uh, over 10 years, and he was council president the year that I came on the council, and it, that was a very tumultuous year. That's the year of the financial crisis in the city, where the city was $15 million in debt, and his leadership got us through that. Um, and he kind of took me under his wings, uh, under his wing uh, at that time. Um, he, uh, the first time I, I spoke uh, at the council, he ruled me out of order and I went up to him and asked him, you know, I just want to know what I did wrong. He said, I told you to keep your mouth shut and, not, and, and listen to and learn what's going on in the council. And I did a, lo a lot of the rules and, and procedures of the council I learned through him and I always put it in my playbook. I knew when he would uh, make a motion or uh, an objection it was something that I would take to heart, and uh, I did enjoy working with him. Uh, it became a joke with him and the uh, and the, the city clerk to move his portrait uh, behind my uh, seat any time that I uh, uh, seats changed, and so that he could keep an eye on me, and and he did. So I I, I think it's a great idea, a great honor to him. Uh, a, a, a Brocktonian who cared so much about the city that uh, he kept coming back. He was, as, as when he was elected uh, in, in 1989 to come back to the council, it, it was called the Old Gray Mayors. It was Paul, Bill Mara, uh, George Pappas all came back at that time, and it was a time when we needed that kind of um, uh, leadership in the city, and he certainly did provide it. So. I commend Councilor Cruz for filing the order, and I hope he receives a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And Councilor Brophy, just uh, to let you know that Councilor Cruz is actually going to be filing another order to name the uh, 
bathroom in the basement after yourself. <laughs> Thank you. That's not true. Uh, before Councilor we Cruz. vote on this, uh, Councillor Stanetsky, you have some members of the family here, if you'd like. I to do. I do. Thank you very much, Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Councillor uh, Profi. Good to see you. I have my brother Charles and his lovely wife Mary here. And uh, Doug couldn't be here, so Doug wanted you to say, uh, just to say to you, Chick, uh, mind your manners. That's his words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate it all, for, uh, and I know, I know he does. Uh, he was asked back in 64 if they, if they could name the Gilmore School after him. He said, my God, he said, I'm still alive. Don't name anything after me. So <laughs> it's time. Thank you very much. If there's no, no others, I'd like to make a motion to recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion been made and second to recommend favorably back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? It goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. And just one quick comment that I, I will make when I first begun as a school committee member. I know everyone hates to hear that, but in any case, <laughs> I, I had to the right of me was uh, the Honorable Mayor David Crosby, and second in line came uh, Mayor Studensky, as well as he was a very good friend of the family and, and my father and he, uh, I guess if they were both here today, they could tell you stories about what they did in Camp Hello. But in any case, um, as I said early on, I think it's well overdue and it's definitely well fitting uh, to name that building after uh, the late Mayor Paul Studinsky for all his uh, work. Uh, that being said, Madam Clerk, we will go to item number two. Appointment, David Texera of Brockton as a member of the Brockton Housing Authority for a five-year term ending March 2020. Invited David Texera. Good evening, Mr. Tech Series. Sorry for taking so long this evening. Nice to see you. So. Any, uh, would you like to make a comment at all? Or? No. I'm, nope. I'll move for a favorable recommendation second. back to the full city council. The motion's been made and seconded for a favorable recommendation to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Thank you and thank, thank you for counsel. serving. We thank appreciate you. it very much. Um, we also have item number three is Mr. Clegg. He could not be here this evening, uh, counselors. He did call uh, and left a message at my home as well as he called the... Uh, Clerk's office here today. So, Chair, make a favorable favorable recommendation. Favorable. Second. Second. Motion been made and seconded that uh, we reappoint Mr. Clegg. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Item number four, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of $124,604.01 from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs Fiscal Year 2015 Formula Grant to the Council on Aging Elder Affairs Grant Fund. This grant is to be used for salaries, including overtime, energy, department equipment, and repair, printing, office supplies, and registration memberships and subscriptions. <clears throat> Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Janice Fitzgerald, Director of Council on Aging. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Questions or any presentation? Anything you know? No. Councilors? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion been made and second to recommend favorably to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? It goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Good the evening. next one is mine also. Okay. Yeah. You can stay right there then. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of $600 from the Massachusetts Association of Council on Aging Fiscal Year 2015 Keep Moving Walking Program Grant to the Council on Aging Grant Fund. This grant is to improve the lives of people over the age of 50 by promoting physical activity to help prevent and postpone chronic disease, build healthy bodies and minds, and keep individuals socially connected. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, and Janice Fitzgerald, Director of Council. Good evening. Agency. Good evening. How are you? I'm well. Any presentation? No. Nope. Favorable recommendation. Motion to recommend, recommend Motion favorably. Motion made and second to recommend favorably to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full city council. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh. Item number six, Madam Clerk. Order appropriation of funds up to four million in excess of amounts already appropriated for the DPW highway snow removal for the purpose of fiscal year 2015 snow removal. As it stands, this winter's fall snowfall amount has been excessively high. The present snow removal budget of almost two million three hundred fifty-eight thousand has been depleted. The deficient the deficit was already in excess of about 2.3 million before the end of February and about one month of winter storm months remaining. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, and Larry Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Mr. Condon. Good evening, Councilors. Good evening. Uh, what we're asking for here, and if there were questions about the actual snow removal, uh, Commissioner Rowley is here, but what we're asking for is the permission to continue to spend on our 
uh, snow removal cost in a deficit fashion. Um, this is not a request for appropriation, but just for the authority to spend the money. The state law allows you to deficit spend above an appropriation for snow and ice removal with the permission of the city council. We're asking for $4 million of authority because with this winter, we simply don't know when we'll stop getting snowstorms and we don't want to have to come back to you twice. So I don't think we'll need all $4 million, but if we have another big snowstorm, we could need it. So $4 million is in excess of the 2.358 that's been uh, appropriated and this will allow us to pay the bills when they come in. This doesn't fund the deficit. We're not recommending an appropriation to fund it yet for several reasons. Uh, one, we haven't finished the winter. Two, uh, we've applied for some state and federal assistance, so we don't want to be appropriating the money until we know whether we're going to get that federal assistance. And finally, uh, when the governor filed his budget, he asked for the authority for communities to spend, uh, to raise any deficit over two fiscal years, and Represent Representative Dubois tells me that has been approved by the legislature. So normally, if you had a deficit, you'd have to raise it in one fiscal year, the subsequent year. We'd now have two years, as I understand it, to pick up that deficit, which would help a bit. So all we're asking for is the authority to spend above the budget. The financing of it will come later. Thank you. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connor. I was going to actually ask about the, um, the two years relative to the, the new change on the Yeah, DOI. that was good news. I, Councilor Dubois yep. just told me that tonight. I don't know if this is a, a, a question you could come up with right now, Jay, or an answer <coughs> to, to a question, but because it's brand new, the two years versus the one year. But <coughs> do you think that it would be split evenly, or do you think you'd just yes. wait for the second year? As I understand it, and maybe the representative could tell me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that <coughs> Governor's proposal was for it to be uh, paid in two equal installments over two fiscal years, and I'm going to guess the legislature approved it in that fashion. Okay. I, I would have to let you know. I don't know. Okay. No, that's, that, that's fine. The two years is great, though. Thank you. And I also want to just thank Mr. Riley and all his staff. Uh, I mean, this is a historic winter, and uh, streets have been great, sidewalks have been great. So thank you, Larry. And please pass it on to your workers as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Um, can you explain a little bit about the two year? I just want. I want to yes. make sure I understand that. Yes. Uh, normally, if you've deficit spent on the snow and ice, just to make it easy, let's say it is $4 million. Yeah. Uh, so we had $2.3 million appropriated. That's $4 million that hasn't been appropriated. And uh, we'd either have to take it out of a stabilization fund at the, before the close of business this year, or if you don't do that, you would raise it on the tax rate setting in the next fiscal year. It comes right off the top of the levy. So we'd have to pay $4 million out of next year's tax revenues uh, before we start to spend on anything else in the budget. What this would do in this legislation is allow us to take, if it's say again it's four million, to take two million of it and take it out of next year's tax levy, and then two million stays as a deficit to be raised in the subsequent fiscal year. We'd pick that up in fiscal 17. And uh, as far as state and federal uh, aid is, I know we've applied for it. Are we getting any kind of indication whether we're going to, going to be receiving any help? Well, we, we haven't yet. The city first applied for its share on the first snowstorm that uh, uh, Blizzard Juno, I think it was called, and we had a, almost a million dollars, 900 and some odd thousand dollars, which we think would qualify for 75% reimbursement. We applied for that. We applied with the state or the federal government? Through the, through the state, but it's, it's, it's federal, federal money. federal money, disaster funds. Uh, we haven't heard on that yet. Subsequent to that, uh, the state has asked that those four major storms, including that first one that occurred in February, be grouped as a single event. And we've also applied for assistance on that, but we haven't heard on that either. So we don't know at this point whether we'll be getting any portion or just the first piece. But it's, if, it, if, it, if it's accepted, uh, to the extent that they accept our cost, it's 75 percent. Thank you. And my last question, what is in the stabilization fund? Uh, two million and a quarter, two million four, something like that. So we'd, uh, we'd, we definitely would be relying on the tax levy to do it because I think I don't think we want to wipe we that. We want to go any, out. any lower yeah. than that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. It's a question for Commissioner Rowley, actually. So good evening. I, good evening. Good to see you. Um, about three years ago, I asked this question of the previous DPW commissioner with the uh, the reality of climate change and all many predictions that we're going to have more storms that we're now we're saying they're historic but they'll become more the norm that obviously impacts how we put the budget together moving forward so that we're anticipating these additional costs and they're not sort of dealt with after the fact so i, I was trying to get a sense of what your department is learning from what's expected in terms of, you know, weather conditions and what will become the new normal and what the new normal will cost us. I, I, 
you can help. I, I believe, Council, that they have increased the monies in the past budgets to go along with this climate change. Uh, I don't believe, like this year, we had 2.3 million allocated for this past winter. Um, prior to that, Jay could probably help me out with the numbers there. It's been about the same amount of money for the last two years. Prior to that, we'd raised it several hundred thousand dollars like every other year. So at one point, or maybe six or seven years ago, it was about a million and a half because the city's ex experience has been that we are continuing to spend more and more money. Um, the problem is that when you increase that amount, in order to be able to deficit spend, you've now obligated yourself to appropriate at least that amount of money in future budgets. So you've got to be a little bit careful because it is an area which can be deficit spent that you don't restrict yourself if you end up in a tight budget by having start set the bar so high that you can't pull back on it. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So you're saying that it's prudent not to um, project too wisely because we're then be committed to that amount of money each year. Yes. And that, I see. Yes, I, I think you should try to get, um, it, for example, if we're going to be spending six million every year, I think 2.3 million isn't sufficient. If it's going to be, you know, three and a half, sometimes two, sometimes four, it is. But if you raise it, say, to three, and all of a sudden we find that we're at 2.8 or three or 3.2, uh, you're stuck at that three million dollars in order to be able to deficit spend in the extraordinary year. So I, I think we got to be careful of raising it. And is there a state team that the city is working with to help us? think through the climate change issue and how it impacts not just snow, but we're dealing with, I would imagine, issues around um, rainstorms and flooding conditions in the city, and so those all have major costs. Are we working with someone at the state level who's scientists who are providing us data to help us plan no. strategies? Is that something that no, we're not. you guys but we think could, we should we be We could doing? look into that. That's a good idea. We will look into that. That's great. I would love to have an update on what you discover in terms of okay. what the state offers in terms of this kind of advice and how we yeah, can let me, make Let me ask around and see what we can find out. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, Council. Councilor Stu uh, I'm sorry. Councilor Dubois. Thank you very much. Um, the, the legislature passed the law that allows municipalities to amateurize the fiscal year 2015 shortfall over two years, not three years. So 2016 and 2017. Just, just to be clear on that. Um, and I had always thought that state law allowed municipalities to deficit spend, and I didn't think that you needed a council order for it. Can no, you, you do. explain that a little bit to me? It, what, what's required is in order to uh, deficit spend, you need to come back to the city council, and, and we've done this in the past, saying we need your permission to, even though it's allowed in the state law, it's a conditional allowance, depends upon getting the, le the legislative body, in the case of a city, city council's approval. But haven't you already deficit spent? You know, we've, we've, we do deficit spend, but we haven't got the authority to pay those bills until we've got your approval for but the I deficit spending. Okay, so you have the, but you're not paying the bills right now. No, we're not supposed to pay until, once the appropriation is exhausted, we're not supposed to pay bills without your permission. Okay, so we appropriated the 2.3 million. Yes. And you've already over, the city yes. has already overspent by 2.3 million for yes. a total of 4.6 million. Something. By the end of February, yeah. February. Yeah. So you, you did deficit spend without city council's approval, <coughs> which the law allows, but I just don't ever remember the second step of appropriating, and we have had winters that have gone over. So right. could you send me the law just so I can look at it? Uh, could you yeah. email me that? Yeah, I can do that. And I would love that. Thank you very much. And then um, what has been, how much more has the cost of clearing sidewalks? I'd like a detail. Uh, can I speak to Mr. Rowley for a second? I just want to make, I think that um, I would really like a detail on um, the expenditures to date. I don't have that. If you had submitted it to the city clerk or I, I've never gotten it. So okay. do you have, could you send me a I detailed can. report on the $4.6 million that stuff that's already been spent as well as what has been deficit spent. So both yes. have been obligated. Yes. I, that's not a problem. I have I a lot of that. that. Is there a breakout in cost? Is there an analysis on um, how much it costs to do the removal on the sidewalks? I can do that. I can I'd give like you that. every snow event that we had. That would be I great. Can, 
the salting operations we've had. Wonderful. Um, school expense, what we spent on the schools. Right. Yes, I can, would we have all that. Would the sidewalk say like on um, Hovenden Ave or North Quincy Street, would you assign that cost to the schools? Well, it was for the schools. Yes, counselor. I'm just asking. And, and, and I do have that figure here. Um, for all the sidewalks we did for the school department, it was $178,000 okay. for snow removal. Well, I thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, I know that I had gotten a lot of complaints from parents um, that send their children to school um, on, in Ma on Maplewood Circle, and they had to walk to the Mary Baker School. And this complaint has come to me probably um, for six years now. And every year I call the DPW about the issue. And this year, um, thankfully for you and Mr. Thomas and the, depart the school department, um, the sidewalk on North Quincy Street were done and there was a shuttle offered right yes. so the, so yes. in the interim once I brought it to the school's attention they offered the students that were walking in the street on North Quincy Street which we all agree is crazy and the, the plows couldn't open the street all the way anyway so it isn't even like they were walking in the gutter they were kind of like walking in a lane um, so it was really great that the school and you took that seriously and offered the parents the opportunity to get their kids to school and home safely so I thank you for that and the reason I'm interested in how much it's cost for the school department to, um, to get those sidewalks done. I'd also like to know which street you did. Yes, so I can that's... personally look at kind of like the walking routes for my district and just make sure that if they weren't done this year, maybe for future years, we can try to figure out how we can work that into the budget costs mm -hmm. um, and make them a priority because the parents, you know, are, that's the most important thing they have is their little babies, right? We want to make sure mm -hmm. they don't get hurt going to school. So I appreciate your hard work and your whole team's hard work. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, okay, thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors before I go back to uh, Councillor Sullivan? Chairman, Sullivan? I just wanted to share with the council. I mean, since Mr. Rowley came in as, as commissioner, of course, this historic winter, and what I will say personally as a councillor at large, serving the whole city, I got at least eight to ten different constituents calling me, and it, it really ran the gamut from people complaining about uh, private uh, snow being dumped on their property uh, to widening the roads to resanding some of the roads to opening up some driveways. And every single time I reached out to Larry Rowley, he got back to me within ten minutes. Right. Right. And that's no lie. And it got taken care of that same day. So I want to thank you, Larry. Um, I mean, it's not a, it's really, yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's a great example of a leader, and, and you know, the men and women that work for Larry are, are, are really doing yeoman's work. So I just want to make that public, and thank you for what you do, Larry. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, Councilor Sullivan. Thank you. And, and, and I couldn't have, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I couldn't have done it without my staff. I had a great staff, and we had, you know, the mayor set up meetings <coughs> before the storm, during the storm, and after the storm. And we worked very close with the schools uh, because that was our number one priority, is the sidewalks for the children. Um, so maybe next year we can expand a little bit more and maybe have less snow to deal with. Right. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> also, follow up, I do just have one follow-up. Um, I also I agree with um, my at-large counselor <coughs> colleague uh, in his comments about you. You were really great. I really appreciate you and your team. Um, but a call that I've gotten just recently from multiple people is that the snow has kind of damaged their chain link fence. Um, I literally have four residents waiting on me replying what the process is to fix this for them. So what is the process for homeowners if they think either a plow has dumped um, so much um, I can, as an example, my fence, but I'm not going to put in a claim. The, 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 there's so much snow that like the chain link is pulled down and then the bar that holds it up is kind of pulled down. And if it's like in the corner where there was a big pile of snow, what or or not? What is a resident's um, opera? What do they do? They, they should submit a claim to the uh, law office here at City Hall, and then they'll submit it to the DPW. We'll go out and investigate it, make sure that we did do it and not a private plow, and then um, we'll submit it back to the law department and say, yes, it was the city's fault. And Thank they you. take it from there, the Thank law Thank you department. so much. I appreciate You're it. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Councilor. There were recommendations. Second. Second. Motion been made uh, uh, and seconded to send back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor? Opposed? It goes back to the full city council. Thank you, Mr. Condon, and thank you, uh, Mr. Raleigh. Madam Clerk, item number seven.
Order that the City Council Attorney is directed to explore and implement any and all legal strategies and filings to maintain and uphold the City Charter and City Ordinances as it relate to the affluent contract the Mayor signed without Council Order or approval, invited Mark Gilday, Legislative Council. Mr. President. Council, Mr. Yes. Council Dubois. At this time, I would like to move to postpone this till Second. the uh, first City, first Finance Committee meeting in April. Motion has been made and seconded to postpone this item to the first finance meeting in April. All in favor? Opposed? That goes back to the first finance meeting in April. Madam Clerk, um, next item. Resolved that the superintendent of schools be invited to appear before a committee of this council to provide an update relative to the Brockton school system. Invited Kathleen A. Smith, J.D. Superintendent. Good evening, uh, Madam Superintendent. Good evening. It's a pleasure to have you here. And before I begin, can I say to Councillor Studensky that uh, my very first time in Brockton and the first campaign when I became a member of the Smith family was for uh, Studensky, a stud they affectionately called him. So I'm very, very pleased that that building will be named after Paul Studensky. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. So I want to thank you for having me here tonight. I especially want to thank Ward 7 Councillor Shirley Azak for inviting us. She is a proud parent and a great supporter of our schools, as so many of you are. I'm not sure if this is a first, but I want to remind everybody that last year, when I came before you during budget season, one of the things that we talked about was having a state of the schools address every year. I think our hope would be that it would happen sometime in January after the mayor's report on the city, but we all know what happened this year with the weather and getting pushed back, so we're pleased to be here at this time. It has been a challenging but rewarding year. We've had to dig deep to do all that we can to continue to provide instructional excellence to every student every day after our Brockton Public School budget was approved at $6 million below level services. Still, the Brockton Public Schools is a team and we have managed to make it through to continue to inspire our students, to encourage them to excel, and to provide them with opportunities to learn and grow as people. The Brockton Public Schools is a nationally recognized leader in urban education, serving more than 17,500 students in pre-K to 12th grade. The district has high expectations, innovative strategies, and a commitment to ensure that all students are provided with a high quality education. The Brockton Public Schools mission is instructional excellence for every student every day. The dedication and commitment of students, staff, and parents is evident throughout the district. We have more than 50 languages that are spoken in schools across the city and the district and offer a variety of programmatic options that includes special education, bilingual education, talented and gifted programs, and alternative education. I am here tonight to share with you some of our successes and challenges, to inform you about some of our exciting and innovative initiatives, and to ask you to advocate for our students. Now is the time that we must invest in our schools, as we cannot sustain another below level services budget like last year's, and continue to provide the level of educational excellence that our Brockton families have come to expect. Our children deserve quality after school programs, athletics, reasonable class size, and they deserve to have a substitute teacher leading them in class when a teacher is out. This is the time that our students and their family need their leaders to lead. It may be difficult, but it will pay dividends for our children and we will provide them with the tools they need to compete in a 21st century economy. If we don't invest in our school system now, we will not only shortchange our children, but we will send our home values plummeting because the value of a community's housing stock is directly tied to the success of its school system. Now, I have given each and every one of you um, a book, our State of the Schools Address. Um, I know that you will take certainly time to read some of the things that we'll be sharing with you. I'm going to just highlight a few of those things. Um, quite honestly, I think that most of you know I could stand up here all night if I were to really share all of our successes and all of our challenges, but obviously time is a concern. In FY15, we had, again, a severely underfunded budget. We're midway through the year, uh, we're actually a little bit beyond that, and we're managing our budget. But we are suffering in certain areas such, again, as large class size. We're suffering in trying to provide additional technology, especially as we began today implementing the park testing. 
and there has been a lot of dialogue out there, and I want to just take a moment to talk about the park testing. Last year throughout the state, school districts were given the opportunity or the option to either stay with the MCAS testing, which has been very successful for our Brockton students, or to try the park assessment. Brockton chose to try the park assessment because as a decision will be made by our Department of Education, our Board of Education this fall, we thought to provide our students and teachers with this opportunity to see this new generation of testing. Whether or not this is the test that will be accepted, it gives our staff, our teachers, our families, our children an opportunity to try. And again, I guarantee you, whether they accept PARC or they go back to MCAS, it will be a new and the next generation of testing. Our extracurricular program suffered for our students. And we are advocating as we speak statewide with a legislative study that is going on about Chapter 70 funding. We are a community that depends on Chapter 70 funding. I want to publicly commend our Chief Budget Officer, Aldo Petronio, who has been throughout the state. There has not been a hearing, which is, again, are, are all parts of the state where people can express their concerns. Aldo has made sure he has been front and center. I attended one down the Cape recently in February. We were able to share with the commission that is listening our concern about the October 1st date when we have many, many students that come between October 1st and the end of the year that we need to educate and money doesn't follow them for another 18 months. We're talking about the high needs of our special needs youngsters, our low income students in trying to provide an equitable education for all of them. A historic winter. I am so pleased that you were able to just talk about our DPW and Larry Rowley. I will commend the mayor again on bringing everybody together for each of those snowstorms and to talk about the struggles. And if you look at the Brockton Public Schools or you look at what's happening in area schools, we missed six days during the historic winter. Six days. And when you think about three major snowstorms, one day for each of those major snowstorms and one day to clean up, yes, we had to look at delayed openings, but we worked together as far as our roofs went. None of you have heard any concerns about that, number one, because you supported facility programs in the past that made sure those schools had roofs that would stay over the children's heads. We made sure that we were right out there, not the second storm, not the third storm, the first storm when we were out there with Deputy Superintendent Thomas, <coughs> Ken Thompson, our facility teams and our custodians, making sure that the roofs were cleared and our buildings were safe for children. So I can't say enough, Chartwells opened up Brockton High School to feed the plow drivers. We had our Smart Start extended day program ready to go for parents who rely on that childcare that if we went to a third day, we would open one site in the city where they could drop their children off so that they could get back to work. Teachers came in on their own time during, or extra time during the delayed openings to make sure that not only children that were in extended day programs, because of our three-tiered busing systems, if we had parents that had to come earlier than the tiers, our teachers were there to make sure that they accepted the children and provided educational opportunities while we were waiting during the delayed openings. I can't thank the parents enough. The first snowstorm, I had 100 phone calls concern about going back to school too early, concerned about the safety of our children, and that obviously is a priority for each and every one of us. After the second and third snowstorm, when we asked for their support, we asked them to stand at bus stops with groups of children. We asked them to carpool to school. We asked them to help us in any way we could. They did. I could count on one hand the phone calls we received after that. I want to thank every one of the Brockton families for supporting us again during a very, very difficult winter. We worked as a team, we worked together, and it was for the good of all. As far as in the superintendent's office, and most of you know that we've had, in my first year, we had the listening tour and the entry plan we de delivered last May. We had a district review that comes along every so many years, and of course that came along last year uh, from November to February. We put our strategic plan out with our school committee, uh, accepting that in August. And I will say that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education asked us for the template that we used putting together the district review, putting together the strategic plan to share with other districts in the Commonwealth. We implemented an, an accelerated educator evaluation plan where 100% of our educators had ratings in our school district. 
And that was no easy feat. I thank Dr. Moran and our uh, Human Resource Department, certainly all our evaluators, because we had had the same evaluation for our teachers for over 35 years. But our teachers stepped to the plate, did an excellent job, and were very, very proud of the work that was done in the district. We successfully opposed excuse me, a charter school application that was truly lacking in a quality education for our students. We underwent uh, a NEASC review at Brockton High School, which is an accreditation process, and we're now presently preparing for a coordinated program review system-wide, which will happen this year. While this was all a great deal of work, it had great benefits. I met with hundreds of parents, students, staff, community members, legislative leaders, college and university officials, clergy, business owners, stakeholders from across the city, and the common message is we all believe in education. Advocacy. We have built a strong team of school committee, city council, and state and federal legislators. We fought the charter school. We are all working together to upgrade facilities through uh, the MSBA and the facilities master plan. You have all come to advocacy luncheons, to dinners. You attended our uh, fall facilities bus tour. I believe Brockton has a very strong and unified team, and I thank each and every one of you for the big part that you are in making that happen. And if you think this happens in every city, it does not. <coughs> We're doing interest-based bargaining for the first time with our teachers' union, the largest union with over 1,400 members. Make no mistake about it, they are the backbone of our educational system in Brockton. They deserve a fair and equitable contract. We have had over 26 meetings with them. We've done 10 hours of training. And for those of you, again, with interest-based bargaining, it's, it's not adversarial. You actually sit together for 26 meetings. We have looked at a contract with items that haven't been looked at in years. I, I'm pleased with the process. And again, I am very hopeful that we can bring it to a conclusion uh, very quickly. Our teachers, again, are working with increasingly needy students. Um, and again, they are the backbone of the Brockton Public School. College partnerships. We're strengthening ties with local colleges and universities, pairing some of our schools with college partners. A number of the schools, uh, East Middle School, Huntington, Davis, Brockton High School, I could go on. Giving kids early college experiences, setting high expectations for our children, uh, and expanding our dual enrollment opportunities. I'm very, very pleased to tell you, as I came before you last year, and I know we had a number of questions, we talked about the diversity in hiring and the grow your own model. We have presently had two meetings, and the first meeting started out with four college presidents, myself, a team from each of the colleges. We have had a second meeting, and we've begun what we call our action plan. Again, Dr. Moran in Human Resources and Laurie Silver in our Grants and Development Office will be leading this initiative. We will continue to get together and support our young students at a middle school level, at a high school level, who are getting into future teacher clubs. They will have our jobs working with children, working with internships, middle school students working in elementary schools, high school students working with middle and elementary schools fostering this group through college and making sure that they choose to come back and teach in the Brockton Public Schools. And when you talk about diversity, our high school is about 80% minority students. So again, why go looking, and of course, we, we, I'm not saying we're not looking beyond the borders, but we have some of the most talented students you have right here in the city of Brockton. And we're very, very excited to get that initiative off the ground. Our Office of Teaching and Learning, again, is transitioning to the new and very rigorous Common Core Standards. I will remind you that that was adopted by the state in 2010. PARC is our new assessment tool. As we speak today, the Ashfield School is our first school to begin the testing. Um, word coming back to me, is it successful? There have been some glitches, of course, with technology. We continue to work with that and will continue to do that throughout this testing period. But we do need technology. We've spent this year a million plus dollars to outfit five schools that are doing PARC with online. Our other schools, because we don't have the capacity, are doing a paper pencil test with PARC. But you have your Ashfield, you have Downey, you have the Huntington, you have the Raymond and the Hancock, which last year actually were the trial schools for PARC with the online testing. So that is happening right now as we speak. And I will be able to certainly update uh, the city council and the school committee as we go along as to the success. But make no mistake about that. We need to continue to support our students with technology. 
We recently visited a neighboring town, a town that has one-to-one -one devices for all of their students. Well, some of the towns have 2,000 students. We have close to 18,000 students, but our students deserve the same opportunity that every student that surrounds the city of Brockton has, and we'll continue to advocate for that. Uh, teachers need common planning time to implement web-based programs to enrich the curriculum. We train hundreds of teachers each year during the day after school. We link with colleges to provide the support. At Brockton High School, we have 314 John and Abigail Adams scholars. In 2014, U.S. World and News Report, best high school, fifth time since 2009. Newsweek, one of America's top 500 high schools for low-income students, and we were recently notified for the 12th time that Brockton High School is a model school honored by the International Center for Leadership and Education. We cannot continue to provide the support we need at Brockton High to con continue to keep this climb unless we have a budget that continues to support our students. We're looking to expand our IB and AP advanced placement offerings. No other school around provides the type of opportunities that you provide for the children at Brockton High School. They have band, drama. They're now going to the state finals in their uh, winter drama festival. Athletics, a new biotech lab in the science, uh, sciences, renovated planetarium media centers in the old IRCs. We have an urban landscape and renewable energy uh, course, vocational opportunities, graphic design, carpentry, nursing, medical interpretation. We have a la large number of hospitals in the city of Brockton. We have students at the high school because of languages where they actually come out of Brockton High School with skills and a certificate to assist in medical interpretation, certainly in our community and beyond. And again, opportunities for dual enrollment. But Brockton High School is now 44 years old. It's showing its age. It needs infrastructure, electrical work, technology upgrades. I was talking to the principal and we were talking about the report that she'll deliver tomorrow night, Principal Sharon Wolder. And the report talks about technology, the need for increased technology. We're concerned about uh, having the electrical infrastructure to be able to support the technology that we need in a 44-year-old school. And I guarantee you, when you look around at the neighboring towns, I don't know if any of you were as amazed as I was when the town of Abington had an override to support their new high school and I believe middle school. West Bridgewater building a new high school. Each Br East Bridgewater opened one in the past, I think it was the past year. Yep. You know, Whitman Hanson, I could go on and on. Holbrook, I believe, is sponsoring a new high school. So this is something, and I know you're on board. I know we've talked about a facility master plan. It might be 10 years down the road, but it has to be down the road, and it has to be something that we're looking at. Whether we're looking at a technology wing, renovation of our current high school, it's time to look at what the needs are in a 44-year-old school. In our bilingual and special education uh, areas, we continue to grow at a very, very fast pace. We've grown 1,500 students in five years in the district. Again, since October 1st this year, we've picked up 245 additional students that, again, we will not be reimbursed until uh, for FY uh, 2017, and that's $2.5 million. Space needs. We presently have a facility subcommittee. I'll be presenting a recommendation for this year to the school committee on March 24th as we are truly bursting at the seams at our elementary level. We have large class sizes. I'm very pleased to tell you that through a grant, we were able to bring on three parent advocates this year, not to be confused with our parent liaisons, which unfortunately for the most part, most part remain as part of our budget cuts. But the parent advocates speak Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, and Hispanic, and what they're, excuse me, in Spanish, and what they're doing is representing those communities to make sure that when it comes budget time, we're going to be educating them, we're going to be talking about making sure that they have all the information that they need to support their students, to support the Brockton Public Schools, and to be partners with us and to be able to advocate. And of course, right now, that has been through a grant, and we seem to be continuing to rely on grants, uh, again, to implement some of the innovative things we'd like to do. With our pupil personnel office, we continue to meet the diverse needs of a community by providing alternative pathways. Our funding uh, often precludes us from realizing a vision. A number of years ago, we had race to the top money. Our vision for, for Edison Academy 
which is our evening academy, <coughs> had uh, college and career, had opportunities, internships and work and job coaching, full-time teachers, all of those things that we have not been able to to bring to completion because of a lack of funding. We still provide the program. We're providing it with teachers that work you know, after school hours, part time. <coughs> but again, it's not that we don't know how to do it. We need the funds to support it. Our human resources office, negotiating with seven unions the past two years. We're working to create an employee assistance program, hiring and recruiting high quality staff and teachers, new fingerprinting policy in place. Again, we're always looking for hard to hire positions such as special education and bilingual. And we don't just sit back. We go out, we work with the colleges to make sure that we're even looking at some of our monitor teacher assistants coming through the system, supporting them to go back to college. Many of them are working in our special education classes. And I mentioned again to you the Grow Your Own model, which we're very proud of. Our financial services. The governor's FY budget is lean. Even with his proposal, we can't maintain level services due to inflation, the health care costs that are rising. The city needs to support education to maintain the programs we have. Looking at the cuts that from last year, again, we sustained $2 million in technology, 500000 in substitute teachers, $100,000 in professional development for staff, 350000 in after-school community school programs, 183 in elimination of middle school sports, and 300000 in expanded learning time at the Huntington School. This year, we're going to face one point. Can you repeat those again? I'm sorry. These are the cuts that you had to make. Right, and they are uh, representative. All, the they are in yeah. the book. Okay, great. And I'm happy to go over it again Thank with you. you if you'd like. We're looking this year at $1.6 in retiree health costs that, um, again, I, I'm sure get, Jay Condon would tell you that we were one of about 130 uh, communities that were not allowed to claim retiree uh, health costs as part of the uh, contribution to Chapter 70 funding. And while we understand that, for the next four years, it's a four-year implementation where $1.6 million uh, will be held against our budget this year. We continue to advocate for Chapter 70 funding. As I said, I'm very pleased with having the presence out there and making sure Brockton was heard. We need to restore teachers, support staff, and enrichment programs for kids. And it's time for Brockton to once again be at the forefront of a court action for equitable education for our students in gateway cities. This is going back to the McDuffie case. I plan to be out there with the other urban superintendents and gateway city superintendents to ask them to join me to start to look at not only the Chapter 70 funding uh, group, which is out there now looking at it, but also to talk about the needs of gateway cities. With our Grants and Development Office, we are expanding grants and development to seek out private and foundation support. Our state and federal grants, we're struggling. They're drying up. As you all know, the governor just came in, and our 9C cuts immediately affect our SEAT program, which is a summer program for our bilingual youngsters. It's, it's expanded learning time for them. Uh, also, our Summer of Work and Learning, a program that's been in Brockton for 20 years, which provides an opportunity for kids to work, to work at City Hall, to work in the school department, many of our businesses. And we come together and support that through a summer program that has been cut with 9C cuts. And most importantly, our quality kindergarten grant. Now, we're able to this year get by with, I believe it's about $130,000. We had to take two paras and put them back on the school side budget versus the grant. We've had to take out professional development money and materials and supplies that we had planned to use for this year. This isn't a cut, isn't a cut next year. It's a cut happening to us as we speak. Um, and preschoolers. Part of it was funding preschoolers, uh, one of the 9C cuts, uh, which is outreach to the shelters, to the hotels, to make sure that these young families are able to support their youngsters before they come into our schools. In operations, we ha have had $36 million in green school repair three years ago in eight schools, and thank you to the city for supporting that. You right now have uh, projects before you that I know, again, I am asking you and you have continued to support. Um, we're looking again to do the uh, facility master plan, and I will be having Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas come up and speak to you in just a moment about some of the concerns you had when I was here uh, just over a couple of weeks ago. You asked about modular classes. You asked about capital improvements in the district, and I will have Deputy Superintendent Thomas share with you. In closing, 
We are working with minimal staffing after a very difficult budget year last year. We have large class sizes and a growing enrollment. Our buildings are aging and need repair, renovation, and replacement. But we have an excellent, dedicated, hardworking team in place, but we are stretched to the maximum. Brockton expects its school district to provide the highest quality instruction and the best educational opportunities. It expects educational excellence. It is time to continue to invest in our schools. We are trusting the city council, the mayor, to support education for our students and families and kids in this city, no matter what it takes. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you this evening. I'd like thank to invite you, uh, Deputy uh, Superintendent Thomas to come up. No problem. And just before, uh, and while we're waiting for the Deputy Superintendent to come up, I do want to acknowledge, I know you have other staff members with you, and he is one, and there's some others, uh, but I do want to acknowledge some uh, school committee members that are also present here. I see the Vice Chairman, uh, Attorney Minicello is here. I thought I saw Mrs. Joyce from Ward 4. Uh, Mr. Henningsen from uh, Ward 7. I know Mr. Jordan's here. If I left anybody out, I apologize, but uh, we've... Yes. And Judy Sullivan, I, I'm, I'm sorry, where's Judy? Over there, there she is, hiding like she always is, that's it. Judy from... Uh, Ward 5, and I appreciate you being here as well. So with that being said, we thank you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you very we'll, uh, much. We'll hear from the Deputy Superintendent at this, uh, at this time. Good evening, Councilors. I uh, just wanted to give you some information. Um, I left some handouts uh, about uh, modular classrooms and basically a list of capital repairs that have been put together. I've been uh, in my position for the last four years, um, so I can take any questions. Um, the modular classrooms, again, um, they were put in between 1992 and 1995. They usually have a 10 to 12 year shelf life, and obviously you know that we're well beyond those. Uh, I think uh, Council President Ionary was on the school uh, committee when I those I was there when in. they were born, those, yes. So, um, and we know that those are issues. The unfortunate thing about the MSBA is you cannot apply to the MSBA to get 80% funding reimbursement to replace modular classrooms you have to either uh, trash them or get new ones um, for example if you wanted to replace the five at the Kennedy last year with with new ones it would have been probably about seven hundred thousand dollars to replace those and get new modular classrooms and again with only a shelf life for between I think they have a little bit better of a shelf life now usually about <coughs> 15 years where before they were about 10 then I also wanted to leave you with um, some information on, again, all the capital repairs. Uh, that's every school that we have. Um, as you know, that we have 23 school buildings, 25 buildings if you include Central, and now uh, we have Parent Information Center at the bank, and that's over 2.5 million square feet of floor space that between our facilities de department and um, Jimmy Cassieri and the public property uh, who do a great job of in-house, we try to do as much work as we possibly can on the thousands of light fixtures, electrical outfit, outlets, and plumbing fixtures, sinks, and toilets. I mean, we try to fix everything in-house uh, between public property and the facilities um, department. So uh, I can take any questions you have about facilities, and I look forward to working with you. And again, I've appreciated, uh, if it wasn't for the eight roofs that you voted to put on three years ago, um, you remember the Davis and Raymond. You probably were getting phone calls four or five years ago about over 125 leaks at each one of those buildings. We actually were looking at closing the Raymond School um, five years ago. It was in such poor shape because of the roof. If you didn't vote to support that program through the MSBA, uh, those schools house between the Raymond and Davis, they house over 2,000 students. So, uh, And with the snow that we received this winter, we would be in major trouble if it wasn't mm -hmm. for your support. So uh, I appreciate that, and it's made life a lot easier with, with those new roofs and with, um, you know, three more to come soon. So we appreciate it. I can take any questions if you have Thank any. you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Superintendent. Just before, I just want to make one comment. As I, as I look through this sheet, there's one page that I see missing, and that's the David E. Crosby Administration Building. I don't see a sheet that <laughs> highlights that, and I'm only going to make one mention that we all need all of us need to do something in regards to that roof over there and it can't go undone any longer seriously um very concerned about the safety issue there and you and i have spoken about yep. that and i know i was there and we did it some years ago it was a band-aid effect but it's it's time we have to do something historic building and i would hope that somebody somebody can go chase some grant money i totally 
believe in that, and I think that's what's still missing here in City Hall and the Mayor's office is a grant writer that could go out and capture those things that can help all our buildings. And uh, enough said from me here. But in any case, thank you for, for that. Questions? Um, I know Council Barnes had the first for the dep uh, for uh, superintendent of schools, and then we can go from there. Yeah, uh, for you too, um, Mr. Oh. Thomas. Actually, go ahead. He can go first. Just for clarification, the capital plan that you uh, sent us, and it's highlighted red for yeah, I'm projects sorry. completed. Yeah, the, and those are all the projects completed, and then down the bottom there was some additional work that was completed, and everything left in uh, in the in the black writing is is work to be done. Okay, and. Is it just funding that's holding those projects up or time? Uh, it, it's, it's both okay. time, funding. Again, we try to do everything in-house to save money. Um, we don't really like hiring outside contractors because it is expensive. So um, we haven't been able to hire, obviously, new people to get some more work done. But also, a lot of these renovations you could put in. Um, that's why I look forward to maybe of a, you know, a subcommittee working together of the school committee and the city council because... You can put a lot of these renovations through the MSBA, okay. which is 80% reimbursement, but I think you have to have a plan in place uh, with the city council to look at where the funding's coming from, because again, we still have to fund at 20%. So, but a lot of these improvements, especially at the ones at the high school, uh, obviously is concerning. Um, another one that's other than the modular classrooms, uh, North Junior High is a concern. Uh, I, th I don't know, I think you walked through North Junior High when we did the facilities tour, and. Uh, that's a concern of mine. That that's been a, it's a worn building. Uh, it needs a lot of work. Um, and again, there's obviously other places with the average age of our buildings being over 50 years old. I think, um, but I think it's something that, you know, we actually should have uh, a joint committee looking at how to approach hmm. the repairs and how to approach. Again, there is funding from the MSBA, but you know, we have to have a plan for our 20 percent of the year. Okay, and um, thank you. And Welcome. actually, uh, Superintendent Smith, just Can one. I make also a comment? Um, and I, I don't know which year this was. I've, I've had lengthy discussions with uh, Aldo Petronio, and there were many years where you had, and I'm talking years ago, a million dollars in the budget for capital repairs. So you would have a plan each year for those buildings, those renovations. I mean, you have over 25 buildings you know, in your schools to take care of. This year, I think we have $150,000 away for extraordinary expenses and I'm here to tell you on August 29th we had a fire up in the I don't know if it's called the penthouse at Brockton High School where communications were and that was an $80,000 price tag so right away you can see where we were before children even walked through the doors in September thank you uh, first if I could just say I um, I really find it helpful the uh, the update calls and the the robo calls that have gone out, especially during this the extraordinary storms and um, some of the other communication calls that have gone out uh, to the council. I really do appreciate that and keeping everyone abreast and informed of what's going on within our district. And I just wanted to also just commend you and your team on um, the new heights situation and um, the action that you took getting right in there and making sure that you fought for our kids and, and advocating for what was appropriate for what we uh, have in the district. With that said, you mentioned about the Grow Your Own and I remember the last time when uh, Councillor Rodriguez, uh, I guess, asked you to come to do like a quarterly update and I asked at that time how many administrators of color were there in the Crosby building and I was supposed to, I think I was supposed to get an, an answer, but I don't recall getting one. And I just kind of wanted to find out exactly what the status of that is. We certainly have that data. Um, I know uh, Dr. Moran has provided it a number of times, and I'll be very happy to, to share it with you. We continue. Uh, the other thing that I will tell you is, again, we, we promote from within as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We certainly look for the best talent wherever it comes from. I'm very pleased whenever I see our administrative internship program, which happens every year. Um, and, and again, it, not that it depends on the budget, but what we do is we take teachers out of classrooms, out of other areas, to let them try out administration, to work on a project, to work with an administrator. And that's also part of our Grow Your Own. And we are seeing some of those uh, teachers that have come out. Uh, they are, some of them are minority teachers, and they are getting promoted into positions. Administrative positions? Administrative positions. Okay, so I could get a number? We can certainly give you the data on what we have, but I want you to know we continue to work on that. Because okay. last time, if I, I actually kind of did some, some 
checking then, that was maybe eight months ago or something like that, I think, um, but there were only three in uh, the entire building in several of the other offices, and it, it was, I was kind of, like I said, I was waiting for the number, but that's what, that, that was what I, I, I got, and I think maybe one of them either left or something, something happened. Um, so it, it's dwindling and not increasing as, as I think what some of what you said may have may lead us to believe so i just want to make sure that we are we're doing something actively now and i get the grow your own program i get that but that'll be another 10 years you know and and, and it, then will, of course, it probably will be for but you know it, it's it, it has to start somewhere and we continue right. to to work with hiring um mm -hmm. our human resource offices out there looking even to hire teachers of color. We are not the only one that is struggling with this. Right. But I'm very, very pleased with some of the initiatives. You know, I've been there a year and a half, and we have initiatives in place. Mm -hmm. We're working with colleges. It's not just something happening internally. Mm -hmm. We're talking to college partners. We're talking to businesses. We are looking to, and you're right, it could be 10 years down the road where we look very different as a school system, and I'm very pleased to do that. Right. And, and just one more thing that actually a teacher brought up to me. Um, he's a male teacher at Brockton High, and his concern uh, was the lack of male influences and in male teachers in the classroom. And um, with the increase of the students that are coming in, a lot of young boys that need that kind of structure and, and you know schools where they spend most of their time so just I just wanted to put that out there as well is in the implementation of these programs that also the the qualified in, uh, male teachers are also uh, and it's certainly poached, at, a, at our middle school in our high school level, right. we have more male teachers but it is a female dominated profession right, right. especially at our elementary schools uh, and again I know that our human resource office um, is sensitive to the fact that diversity means many things. It means gender. Uh, mm -hmm. It means you know looking at people of color. Uh, it means uh, getting the best qualified people that we can in the district. But we are very sensitive, you know, uh, to what it means to our community and to our children and to our families. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilors, any other comments? No. Councilor Stewart. Excellent. Thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. Oh, I get to see you. So first of all, I have to say that personally, I was a little. Uh, taken aback and it struck me personally when you mentioned that Brockton High School at 44 was showing its age considering I just turned 44 but I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that and uh, um, well, counselor I won't tell personal. you how I feel about numbers right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a couple questions about um, so the curriculum so the Common Core the Massachusetts so as you are aware and it's reported in the paper so I'm at the Department of Education and uh, we see each other frequently in Malden and other places um, in terms of the Common Core state standards and its level of implementation in Brockton what is that how would you rate how well instruction aligns with the Common Core um, at, at this point here, we certainly, uh, at our elementary and middle school level, are farther ahead, farther ahead implementing the Common Core. We continue to work at the high school level. I should have mentioned uh, during my opening when I talked about the strategic plan and our teaching and learning. Deputy Superintendent Elizabeth Barry has done an excellent job. Uh, she's been working on this a number of years, and I'd like to invite her to come up and answer the question, Councillor Stewart. That would be great. Oh. That's actually a really great question, and um, it's something that I would say where we are with implementation with Common Core, we're actually pretty proud of in Brockton because the Common Core standards are getting some recent sort of controversial attention, but we've been responding to them since they were released a couple of years ago in draft form, and because of that, we've been able to bring teachers into um, our curriculum design and our assessment design. So we've been looking at the standards since 2011 and making changes to our curriculum based on the new standards. And what's really nice about it is because we didn't wait, um, we were able to actually respond in a real incremental way that involved teachers and sort of appreciated the autonomy and the expertise that they bring to the profession. So it, it's, um, and I, maybe it's less of an implementation than a transition because um, those standards are still being used in some cases, yep, but, it, some but, cases. It, but it, so you're saying it's more prevalent in the elementary grades and less on the high school? 
Uh, yes, I would say that. And I think that um, the, some of the methods that we've used at the elementary and middle school level where we've actually been able to use steering committees to look at the standards, to unpack them, and to really talk about the learning tasks that we want students engaged in to meet those standards as well as the assessments. Um, I would say that that work is underway at the high school, but we have a uniform delivery method um, K to 8 that um, we just don't have quite yet at the high school. Um, but I think that we, what's good about it is that we, we have a way in which it's worked, and so we would use those same types of structures, perhaps high school restructuring as well as some additional steering to really get um, the standards embedded in the way that they should. I see. And do you think part of it has to do with the fact that MCAS is still the CD and so teachers are, are instruction, instructional leaders are hesitant to tweak with instruction when the, the assessment is sort of based on not fully aligned with the new Common Core standards? Is that Absolutely. Part, part? I mean, that competency determination right. is definitely part of the reason. Um, and, and we most certainly had more urgency around what we were doing at the lower levels. And we also saw, um, even a couple of years ago, M how MCAS changed a little bit. Right. So um, we were waiting for that park assessment, but we also saw that the MCAS test and the standards within it and the kinds of things that we were asked to do were changing, um, which obviously is not the case at the, at the upper level. And I think that that is probably part of the reason why um, they have not felt that urgency. Um, I will tell you that um, specific departments within Brockton High School and, and the other uh, high school levels, um, they have some um, great rubrics. They have some. They have some things that are well underway. But um, what we would what we would want to do is make a more sort of uniform approach and, and bring more teachers into the fold as we really look to unpack the standards at mm -hmm. the. 9-12 level and what that means. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, a couple more questions for the superintendent. So the, the, when you mentioned dual enrollment, I, I mean, I guess that can be described in, in different ways. So there's gateway to college, that's dual enrollment. Some people consider dual enrollment uh, sort of ad hoc courses taken at a community college. So how are you defining it? I'm curious about with uh, gateway to college, who pays for the college courses? Is that a state-funded initiative uh, or well, district you know, pays for it? The Gateway to College program, which of course we do with Massasoit Community right. College, um, we, we certainly pay the cost of those students that come from the Brockton Public Schools to go to the Gateway College program. I'm not sure if there's separate funding for the dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. Because um, someone has to pay for the college courses, right? They do. I, I think it's part of the money that we pay. Uh, I'm not sure oh, if Massasoit is able to, with that funding, um, the students take high school level courses. If they're able to transition over to college courses, obviously it gives them a leg up. They're able to take courses and matriculate okay. you know, at Massasoit or, or another school. Is the budget director still here? Uh, Aldo Petronio is here, I believe. I'm, so are we, um, so is that accurate that the school system pays Massasoit for the courses that the students take in for the Gateway program? The, what happens with the Gateway program is that um, they receive our Chapter 70 funding. We give them our state share and we, we keep the city share of it. That's interesting. So that's the uh, contract we put in place. So they're still considered our students. They count on our roles, but they're in the dual program. And so, they're, so they're, those students are a lot more expensive than your regular high school student if they're for if they're paying for the college courses? Yes. Okay. Because I think in other states, there's actually some type of state funding that takes place, uh, and maybe our colleague who's our, our state rep could you know, look into that, but there's separate funding, and I know in Texas, where it doesn't come from the, the school district to support that program, but from the state. So it's interesting that we're paying for it directly. Okay. Well, you heard us actually during the charter debate, you know, that was a concern that we had when they were talking even about a, a grade 13. Mm -hmm. You know, where was that funding coming from? Was it going to be the chapter 70 funding, funding coming from the state? Mm -hmm. Was it additional foundation money that they spoke of? But we never had a clear answer there. Okay, because we would have made sure we were positioned for our students to also receive that additional funding. Right. Uh, and that certainly prohibits dual enrollment being, being expanded to more students. If the it becomes a cost prohibitive issue and less of an opportunity issue in terms of you know, scheduling, curriculum, and stuff like that. Um, so I appreciate the materials and I read through it sort of quickly, but I noticed that Mr. Cobb is the principal of two schools. So I'm trying to understand how that works because they're in two different locations. 
Mr. Cobb, uh, Dr. Cobb, Dr. Cobb was, yes. uh, was hired uh, for Edison Academy, and you did hear me speak about how difficult our, our goal, and we had lots of race to the top money, and I was part of the initial planning for the Edison Academy. And as I said, it involved job coaches and career opportunities and all kinds of things for those kids that weren't making it at Brockton High School and needed a multiple pathway. What happened during the uh, budget cuts last year or the deficit that we faced was I could not bring full-time teachers, which had been our plan for the Edison Academy. At the Champion uh, High School, I do have full-time staff there. And what I asked Dr. Uh, Cobbs to do was to be the principal of the Champion High School. Um, we did not have a principal as such for the school. And he continues to support Edison, but I actually have supervisors there in the evening. Mm -hmm. That program takes place after 2.30. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Cobbs will oversee some of the things. Uh, he has paid some additional stipend money but he is the principal, uh, again, uh, of Champion High School and supports okay. Edison Academy. That makes, that makes sense. <laughs> well, I'm always complimenting you and your work in, in Brockton, and, and at a recent um, park meeting there were two. There was your um, math coordinator and your ELA coordinator there, and um, so I leaned over to one of the assistant commissioners uh, and said, I just, I just, Brockton is, is incredible, and I don't think he really was aware of my affiliation with Brockton. His response was, it's an amazing district, so I think, and you're talking about Dr. Heather Ronan. Yes, Heather and Ronan. And Eileen McQuaid, yes, who are, yes. we are so proud to have two park fellows. So throughout the state, as we implement and review the park assessment, we actually have two people that sit on this team. Uh, they come back and support our district, support our teachers, are presently out there supporting the testing that is now going on. So we are very proud of the work they do. Yeah. Um, and so one last comment. I, I do want to reiterate, reiterate the importance of the point that my colleague, um, Council Barnes, is making around diversity and uh, personally counting on your leadership to move the needle on that uh, issue because it's been a concern of mine when I started volunteering. My first act of volunteerism in Brockton in, in 1999 was on your um, Community Schools Advisory yes. Board. Uh, and that was an issue at that time, which is you know, some time ago. So I I'm, I'm have confidence that you'll figure a way through on that. Um, so one last question for Mr. Thomas, and then, uh, okay. and this is a very technical question. It's just I'm just trying to understand um, a very discrete piece around facilities. So th the reason that schools typically go from carpet to tile is because if you ruin carpet, you have to replace a large part of the floor, but now they have uh, tiled carpeting, right? Yes. So just explain and that to me a little we, bit more. And what in the places that are um, more uh, conducive to issues with noise, we will stay with carpet and use the carpet tiles, as you pointed out. If if something spilled on the carpet or a part of it gets ruined, you could just pull up one, two, three, four tiles and replace it. Uh, and then you don't have to replace the whole carpet. Um, it's a little ex more expensive up front, but the replacement cost is a lot cheaper. And in the places for obviously cleanliness, and uh, some people have issues with um, you know, um, dust and mites getting into carpets, then we would, we would go to VCT tile. Got it. Um, obviously, it doesn't obviously collect as much dust and, mm -hmm. and dirt. Uh, and grime from outside, so it depends on the areas that, and it depends on the noise levels and things like that. I, I apologize for the mundane question, but just wanted to know, oh, and no uh, and my interaction. For you, I just wanted to compliment you as well and your team on just being incredibly responsive. Uh, and the school system in general has been just a, a great partner and, and fantastic to work with. And your leadership specifically has, has been worth noting, so thank, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Azak. Good evening, Mr. Thomas and uh, Superintendent. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have to say I'm very proud to say that my kids are part of the Brockton school system. Every day I thank um, God for it. I appreciate everything that you all do. I have a very small and short question. Um, last year with the budget cuts, I mean, a lot of parents were concerned, but the only thing that really comes up, and I get asked often about after-school sports, and um, have you thought about possibly bringing it back and ha allowing parents to pay a portion? I mean, I believe some parents may, you know, 
pay a portion oh. of it or maybe take part in it, but just bring it back because kids miss it. Well, Councillor Azak, uh, again, one of the things that we did, we have obviously just, not just started, but we're having uh, just got some of our figures initially with the governor's budget. Um, we're starting to take a look at our figures for next year. One of the first things we did was put everything back in the budget that we cut last year. And we did that because we have seen what it has done to children. I have uh, Dr. Cliff Murray uh, standing behind me, who again is two roles this year, principal at West Middle School, and also um, our executive director, uh, middle school alternative school. And one of the things he keeps telling me, again, at the middle school, which we cut out clubs, we cut out middle school sports. We are able to, because of the support of uh, Save Our Sports, put some of the intramural programs back. But it's difficult for these kids not to have those after-school experiences, not to have, and again, it isn't just athletics, it's fun times with friends, it's preparing for a science fair or projects, things that we were able to do for students. And we did well. Our teachers were there to support all of those programs. So we will once again take a look at that, you know, whether, you know, it is very, very difficult. And I've worked in community schools. We've had fee-based programs. Um, and, and sometimes that becomes the haves and the have-nots. I stood today with Angela Henry, and I am on the uh, DJ Henry uh, Board of Directors. And that is a group that continually supports our families in the Brockton Public Schools in the city of Brockton, so kids that wouldn't normally be able to have access to programs. And we're sitting looking for funders in our business community to help support these kinds of things to help our families. So we are very, very sensitive to all of those after school opportunities because it isn't just you know, the accountability and the instruction, which is obviously the most important thing we do for our children, but it's also looking at the whole child. So I'm here to tell you that when I tell you they're back, they're back so that we can take a second look and do everything we can to provide some of these opportunities. Our Grants and Development Office, I assure you, continues to look for anything. We've applied for grants, a big after-school grant. They give you um, a report to tell you how you have done in applying for the grant. And although we did really well, it's very, very competitive when you're out there you know, with school districts throughout the country. So we will continue to, to try to support those uh, opportunities for kids. Well, thank you. And I think my point is just to don't forget that parents, a lot of parents are willing to participate too. So if it's important for them to get their kids involved in them, they may, um, you know, have put in some funds in there. So I don't, I don't want you to put that in. No, it's, it is out in the forefront. Oh, we, very we are good. talking about it as, as we speak. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council. Council Dubois. Thank you. Hello, Superintendent, I really appreciated your presentation and your team's presentation. I have to agree with my fellow counselors and commend you, Mr. Thomas, and your whole team on the good work that you're doing, as well as Aldo. So, um, the high school is 44 years old, and I remember I've been talking to you and other people about that. So, I just want to just publicly state what I think should happen. So, if the casino comes in, I think that the city should prepare to submit to the um, mass building, what is the what, MBSA? What is mass it? school building assistance. Mass school building assistance and figure out what we might get funded at and um, ask the casino or <coughs> every year the casino will be putting $60 million into a community preservation fund. And in our proposal to the Mass Building Association, tell them that we are going to appeal and request a grant from the, the Community um, Improvement Board to move the high school. I know that this is about moving backward, but I get, I'm getting phone calls from parents on my side of town that are extremely concerned about sending their kids to high school across the street from a casino. And you or I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. You or I or anyone at home might say the stats prove that it's okay. But when you're the parent, um, you're going to have a real concern with that. So we may lose some really good students and put some parents in our city in some real financial stressors because they refuse to send their kid to school across the street from a casino. And so they really stretch Council, their family Council, budget we're not, we're, not here, we're not here to talk about a casino. We're here I, I think to, we're talking about school improvement, right? And school, school. But that's not part overall. of casino. Let's talk about school improvement. That's an item altogether differently than a casino bill at this point in time. 
That's before the voters. We'll worry about that when that happens. Okay, I don't agree with you, but I will move on. I, I, I didn't expect that you would, but Great. I'm just saying. Because I, I think the parents at home don't I'm just agree saying. With uh, that is not the issue. The building is only 44 years old. Let's start there. I went to the old high school, which was 100 and something years old before we built the new high school. So I understand what you're saying, and it does need work. I'm not going to disagree with you there, but I just don't think that that has to be mixed in right now with the casino issue. It's a different issue altogether. Let's just stay on. I will on. move on because you asked Thank me you. to, and that is your role, and I appreciate that. But be prior to me doing so, I just want to state that I've spoken to people in the field, and they say 60 years is the time to replace your high school. So we're pretty close. So start well, planning. That's all I'm saying. Well, I don't know if I'll be here 60 years, but however, but any case, let's, let's just move years forward, away. Councilor. Thank Council you. Council President, can I just respond and tell you that we will be out there at any of the hearings to make sure that we're hearing what parents have to say. So I've exactly. certainly told the school committee that our team uh, will be out as they begin having uh, meetings in the uh, community. And I noticed that at the state level, the kindergarten expansion grants and the governor's proposed budget have been cut, and it was like 23 million for this fiscal year, then cut to 18 million, and now it's zeroed out. Does Brockton have a, um, will that affect Brockton? Well, it's presently affecting us with the, the nine, right as we speak, it's okay. affecting us. And it will certainly affect what we're able to provide. We have kindergarten powers in every one of our classrooms. Right. You know, those class sizes are large class sizes. Some of our kindergartens are, are 23 to 25, you know, little five-year-olds in a kindergarten class. Uh, material supplies, professional development, uh, it's a concern for the district. And I also, uh, representative, counselor, I want to tell you that I am looking, you know, to get our legislative group together. Uh, we're putting together all the lists of 9C cuts and to talk to you about the real effects for us in the Brockton Public Schools so you can advocate right. for us up on Beacon Hill. Well, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And then um, I think <coughs> just in concern to the um, Ashfield and Brookfield and the um, renovation costs, so if I understand um, Assistant Superintendent Tom, Thomas Wright, um, the renovations at the Kennedy School are estimated at 100,000, but replacing the five modular classrooms would be 700,000. Is that what? Correct. OK. Because you have to pay a disposal fee, which is quite high. So how do you think you'll get to a point where you can afford these um, improvements that need to be done, these renovations? Um, we, we, we try to. Put, um, save that 150000 that we get every year um, and not touch it until the end of the year. And that's what we used um, last year to renovate the, um, the Kennedy modulars. Um, the Davis are the next ones that are in really bad shape. Those would be the next ones. And again, I would hope, you know, the goal would be to do at least two. Again, we do them all in-house mm -hmm. to save money. Um, I would like to do the Davis and, and one other. Um, this summer uh, but again it all depends on and money it depends on um, you know the bodies to be able to do the work as well um, like these numbers that I'm giving you these are in-house numbers that us doing it with our own craftsmen along with public property this this if you you're gonna double or triple these numbers if you do it with an outside contractor so um, that w that's why it's a little bit slower because you save money, but it takes longer to do the projects, unfortunately. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and um, Superintendent Smith, you can tell me if this is in here or if I could get information on um, this somewhere else. But um, in my running for office, I learned a lot about student achievement here in Brockton and district-wide. And it seems like our high school is doing wonderfully. But a lot of our elementary schools, when you're just looking at student achievement, if we have 800 schools in the state and five of them are ranking in the lowest 800, for uh, student achievement and five are ranking in the lowest 700 at the list I looked at Absolutely. I'm wondering how can we get our kids up to the level of the kids in Lexington what what is what is the plan with that how do we do that I, I love that you asked that because quite honestly one of the first things I said to you was we know how to be innovative we know how to educate you know students that come from the city students that are again crossing our borders coming in speaking English for the first time I can't do that when I have class sizes ranging at 30 kids in a fifth grade classroom at the George School. And it isn't just educating those students, it is educating the whole child. We're out there advocating for breakfast in the classroom, feeding every student so that they have 
a full belly and they're ready to go, you know, for a day's work. We're out there advocating for dental programs. We're advocating for after school, for tutoring, for interventionists. We know how to do that. And again, we are a level three district, but you hear me say we are hanging by a thread. One of the things happening in the DESC uh, right now is they're looking at level three districts and they're looking at how before they become level four or level five, where there's more intervention from the state. What can they do to support what we're doing in schools? And we're working with our partners in the DESC. Um, they're presently coming out to our district. They're looking at what we're doing and we are going to be sharing challenges. So it's not that we don't know how to do this. We need the technology. We need the textbooks. We need the materials and supplies. We need opportunities for our kids. I need to have parent academies and ways to support parents, making sure that we have, uh, again, people that speak their languages. I cut parent liaisons. Parent liaisons were the lifeline many times for parents getting involved. We just started the Parent Advocacy Center, as I mentioned to you, through a grant that could be cut tomorrow and I'm back to square one. So I could talk about this all night. Yeah. It's, it is a concern, <laughs> and I'm glad you brought it up. And we continue the work that our teachers are doing. It's just yeoman's work with what they're doing and keeping the district. Uh, as Councillor Stewart said, it always makes me feel good that the Department of Education looks to Brockton uh, for some of the best practices that are happening in the district to support our kids. And I'll just close with a compliment. So I was at a Citizens for Public School meeting, and one of the women that was with the McDuffie case came over to me, one of the attorneys, I guess. She worked with the parents in Brockton and said how impressed she's always been with Brockton Public School System, as well as many of the advocates from the MTA. They just think this is a really wonderful urban school district and that everyone on the team is doing a really good job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You, President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Madam Superintendent. I want to thank you for being here tonight. I also want to thank you, Kathy, for what you've been doing in terms of for the Brockton Public Schools, but also opening the dialogue with, with the City Council. It's great to see all the school committee here. I've been on the Council 10 years, and it, under Malone and Nebra Call and Joe Beige, this didn't happen. So this is refreshing. I think the bus tour um, that we took was eye-opening uh, to me. I'm, I have a few questions for Mr. Thomas about that, but I wholeheartedly support the idea. Um, before it was the McDuffie case, it was the Hancock case, the Webby case. I went to school with Robin Webby. Yeah. I mean, this, this is something that needs to be revisited because quite honestly, Brockton's getting shafted. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm only one of 11 here on the city council, but I, I, I say go for that. I really do. It's important. Well, our school committee and our vice chairperson, uh, Tom Minicello, has been actively, you know, supporting this. We've been talking to attorneys, and, and we know that at some point in the near future, as I said, I've been asked to speak to urban superintendents and, and look to see if that's something we want to sign on to. Absolutely. I, I think it's the thing to do. I also... Um, I want to thank you for the update relative, not to, to delve into collective bargaining, but it's, it's good that you, you broached that subject about the teachers because they really are the catalyst uh, for the kids. And, and Brockton is always at the upper echelon. And, um, you know, it's refreshing to hear that you're trying to get more uh, people of color in the classroom, more males in the classroom. I mean, Mike Thomas, class 87, Kim Gibson, BEA, president, class 88. <laughs> These are people that go to Brockton Public Schools and, and continue to stay and work here. And that's, that's what we want to see. So if we can add on to that, great success. It's really a winning team. Um, Mike, I just had a question for you relative to some of the things we saw that day on, on the bus tour. Um, specifically, some of the, the boys and girls' bathrooms, uh, Hancock and Brookfield and North, you know, there was a lot of rust and some of the stalls and, and there was some missing doors. H have that, has that yeah, been the, addressed? The Hancock and Brookfield have all new bathroom petitions. Um, and what the third school you mentioned was no North, uh, North again yeah, is, North. is something that um, this summer we'll put in on new petitions, but North on a larger scale, um, we really need to talk about what we do with Yeah, with I was going to ask about North the auditorium. Is, um, well at, at North. The auditorium, you know, needs new lighting. Thank God that the MSBA, when it fixed the roof, put money in to fix the auditorium, which was condemned um, back in 2010. Uh, but North as a whole, um, it needs a lot of work. The ceilings need to re replace the floors, uh, carpet throughout, new interior doors. It, it needs a whole makeover. North, um, I'd have to stay, other than the modular classrooms that need to be replaced. North needs a lot of attention, and that's something that um, 
again, I'm willing to put um, an application into the MSBA, but again, that has to come with your approval even to be able to submit the application. Uh, it has to come with city council approval. So again, I think it's something that we need to talk about before I just put the applications in without any, you know, regard to the, obviously the city finances. So, you know, you hate to, because I have a good relationship with the MSBA. Um, I've put in a lot of applications and obviously we've had um, 12 approved, I think out of the 14 I've submitted over the four years. Um, and it's a lot of money. And again, I don't want to put the city in a position without having dialogue with, with obviously the members that have to, you know, to allocate the, uh, the funds. So okay. I yeah, think one I, of the things I, that, that I was thinking when Council President Ian Airy mentioned about Central, and again, you know, we all talk about how it looks aesthetically from the exterior. And it, really, that, that's a beauty of a building. Yeah. One thing that we might want to contemplate is, is getting funds through Rob May, the planner. We adopted Chapter 40 R Smart Growth Zoning. And that's in the core area. So that would, Good. in my humble opinion, qualify. Um, so we should look into be that. Um, because we want that to be as beautiful outside as it is inside. Yep. So if that's something we could consider. And talking about buildings, even though it's not owned by the school department anymore, the old Whitman School that I went to on Manamit Street, that is in Ward 2. I want to thank Mr. Kassiri. Um, we didn't have any roof claps, thank God, for any of the current schools that are operational. But there was a small little roof snafu at the Whitman. And I want to thank Mr. Kassiri and his staff for rectifying that, because I'm crossing my fingers still, Jim, that someday we're going to be able to utilize that beautiful school. So it might be old. There's no gym, no calf, but it was a hell of a school. So thank you for what you did on that. And again, thank you, Madam Superintendent, and thank you, Mr. Super Assistant Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Solomon. Councilor Moises Rodriguez. <laughs> Moises, huh? Moises. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Superintendent, and thank you for being here, and thank you for this. Uh, I know I'm the one that brought up the, uh, the module classrooms uh, the last time that you were here. And uh, I, I want to begin by basically just professing how great the, uh, the principals and the school teachers are in the classrooms that deal with our children on a daily day basis. And the administrators that you also have, I mean, they do a wonderful job in dealing with those issues. But that being said, you know, um, I was taken back by your phone call. Uh, the day after your appearance here in the City Council and also the phone call that I received from the Vice Chair of the, uh, of the School Committee. And the reason why uh, I'm actually, I wasn't even going to address this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, it's because I brought up some issues that came from directly from the schools. The, the school in question is the Brookfield School mm -hmm. that I brought up. I actually have a first cousin first cousin sitting in one of those classrooms. And I have a conversation with this uncle of mine on a regular basis, and the details that I provided you that day here came directly from the, mm -hmm. the uncle or the first cousin who is a child, a seven-year-old child in one of those module classrooms. So it's not second-hand information, it's not third-hand information, it was actually directly from this, this parent that had, that had actually gotten this information directly from the child stating those, the issues that they actually had in those schools. And I was bothered a little bit by the fact that I brought up several issues. The ceiling collapse, the, the tile collapsing, hitting a teacher in the classroom, the carpeting uh, that I've noticed is on the list as, as, as one of the issues being fixed, the handrail falling apart in the school. Um, I was bothered by the fact that I think I used the term brown-faced uh, children. You know, Madam Superintendent, they are brown-faced ch children. And that classroom is a Cape Verdean classroom. Of course, they're brown-faced brown children. But it wasn't brought out in terms of um, to, as a derogatory term or as a way to basically demean anything that's done either in the school or in a racial way as it, was brought up, as it was brought to me, that was very offending to me, to be honest with you, because I was stepping into an area to protect these kids and do what I could to help the school system fix the problems that I saw as a problem. And when you get a phone call from somebody within the school system, not to acknowledge the fact that these were issues in the schools, but to basically say how disappointed you were with my comments, Frankly, that bothered me a bit. And I'm, gonna, I'm not done yet. Let me, please let me finish. Um, 
I know that I was told by the, uh, the vice chair that he was going to go address the issues that I brought up in terms of my, race, my racist comments that I made here in the city council. I, didn't, I don't think I brought, I brought up the word race once. What I did say was that the, those kids were brown-faced kids, and there were six to seven-year-olds sitting in those classrooms that some days they have to keep their coats on because the classrooms are that cold. And that's all I was doing, is looking after. Um, I know that often we, uh, we sit here in, the, in this chamber, you know, clapping for certain things and just passing out accolades, but I do recall that I was elected back and forth. into the city council, not necessarily to be a cheerleader, but to basically bring forward concerns that some of these parents actually have. And I do represent some parents in this community that aren't unable to speak for themselves because of the language issue. So sometimes I bring those issues forward only because those parents can't do it for themselves. And that's why I brought it up. So I hear you just answered the, uh, the, my fellow city uh, council at large Barnes in terms of the approaches that we're doing to, to, um, to get additional um, um, minority teachers involved. Um, we had a young lady by the name of Leah Sereno who graduated from Brockton High in 2007. She was the, uh, when we created the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, she was the chair of that committee. Very involved in the community, went on to college, graduated from Bridgewater State College, was a, para, uh, a paraprofessional in one of the schools, passed her test, couldn't get a job here in Brockton, and today she's teaching in Fall River. So when I hear these things about, you know, we're trying to do is, you know, the best we can to, to you know, basically level the, uh, the playing field with some of these, uh, you know, to increase the number of minority teachers that we have in the system, I hear these stories all the time. And yet somehow, when I bring up the issue that we have some brown-faced children in some schools, I get a phone call that my comment was so devastating. Not to the fact that we have some real issues. And when you called me up the next day, you basically said, yeah, I sent somebody to the school. There were no mold there. It's apparent from this list that there are issues in that school and in those classrooms. So I wasn't kind of making this stuff up when I brought it up. So to receive a phone call, and I told you that I'm going to be a partner on this with you to help you, you know, get this stuff done. But you know what? I really didn't appreciate. You said that you didn't appreciate my comment, but I didn't appreciate that phone call. Counselor, you and I have known each other for a long time, and quite honestly, I didn't think this was going to become a public debate. But I will tell you quite honestly, I took very seriously what you said about a classroom. There are issues throughout this district. It, and, and my interpretation on that evening, and I listened very carefully to mold, to leaking, to ceiling tiles, I immediately spoke to Deputy Superintendent Thomas. I, I don't think I was out of this building, I called him. We made sure Ken Thompson was over there, Jamie Domestico the very next day, because that's what you do when concerns are brought to you. My phone call to you was very personal. You're correct, I'm the superintendent. You represent people as the city councilor. But again, my phone call to you was telling you how I felt. Never would we place children in substandard classrooms based on the color of their skin. That didn't need to be said at all. You're correct. They were SEI classes that are in those particular mods. At the Davis School, I have them in the middle school component for all the students. At the Kennedy, I have an SEI class and I have a number of fourth grades that are placed in the renovated classrooms. So I apologize to you if I offended you by the phone call. It was as a friend. I was telling you how I felt standing here that evening. I'm sorry if I insulted you in any way, but I will continue to keep those lines of communication open. Now, if there is somebody that isn't hired, I can certainly look into something when you give me a call when something happens at a particular time. I can't answer if they had the right credentials. In Massachusetts, the principals are the hiring agents in a school. The principals understand that we are looking for diversity in our teaching force. So it is something that we take very seriously. And if any one of you call me, if you're recommending people to teach in Brockton, I am very, very open to have those discussions and will make sure that people have an honest opportunity to interview and to be hired for jobs. So once again, Counselor, I truly apologize to you. I spoke to you that day as a friend. I know I followed up. Um, certainly the next day you had called me again. 
Um, and I hope we can move on from this and I will continue no, to work I, with I you. I agree. I wasn't going to address it, but the fact is that after your phone call, I received another nasty phone call from the chair of your school committee, basically not looking at the issues, Counselor. not the looking at the issues that I brought, but the fact that Council, I'm, I'm going to slow you down because it's becoming a debate on, on a personal phone call that you had with the superintendent, you and her going back and forth in, in phone calls you've received. And I, I may understand your I frustration see. to a point, but I don't think that we need to have it here that we're airing it as into a debate because then it leaves it that other people would like to even make response, and I'm not going to allow that to happen. So Mr. I Mr. want Chairman, you to stay. Thank you. I, I will stay on the. On, I want you I to stay, stay on, on what, what we're but talking. But the reason about. why I brought it up is because it was addressed in the school committee. That's why. And and in that I. I'm not disagreeing with you, then, that, then as I always say in an old-fashioned way, then I think three or four of you need to get together and have a cup of coffee and iron it out. That's how I've always said it, but we're not going to do it here. I'm I understand that, Mr. Chairman, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that we're in the business of representing people, and when those people whose voices we bring forward because they can't do it themselves, we expect at least that to be left where it was, and it did not require that kind of a response, and, and that's I, why I brought it up. But I, at the same I time, but I want to thank. Continue on with. I, I would like to thank uh, Assistant Superintendent Thomas for bringing this uh, issue forward, and uh, and you can count on me in terms of helping you push these issues because, at the same time, we've done what we were supposed to do. We, there's a concern from uh, from some parents and some folks in the community. We're bringing the issues forward, and that's how we resolve the issues. And I do accept whatever apologies that you made. I mean, you and I are, I'm a product of the Brockton public school system. So, you know, I can't say anything ill about our system uh, because my children graduated from that system and I did myself. So, but I, I want to leave it here because, uh, like I said, I'm one of these types of individuals that, you know, pulled, you know, uh, what you see is what you get, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, with that, if there are any, any more questions or if there's any further question, I'd like to make a motion to accept. To, uh, to uh, recommend favorably to the Second. Second. Motion's been made and second to recommend favorably back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? This report goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Madam Superintendent, you for being here. For Deputy Superintendent and your staff, school committee members, we appreciate uh, your presentation this, right. this evening. And as always, I'm sure the city council, and I only speak as myself, but I can speak on behalf of them. Yeah. We are all in this together, and, and we believe in loving it, our educational system here in the city. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Time. Item number 10, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the mayor, chief of police, chief financial officer, and the city's building superintendent come before finance committee to discuss the position of code enforcement office in conjunction with the police department and provide the committee with an update on when this vital position will be reinstated and operational on a d daily basis. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, chief financial officer, John Crowley, police chief, James Cassieri, superintendent of public property, and Louis Tataglia, executive director of Board of Health. Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, uh, I filed this resolve uh, in conjunction with you as, as capacity as Ward 3 Councilor. I, I do know Mayor Carpenter, as you said earlier when we opened this meeting, is uh, in Boston, but I do know the Chief is here, and I know Mr. Kassiri is here, I know Mr. Conn is here. So if there's no uh, objections among my peers, I'm going uh, to see if we can open this resolve, discuss it, but I am going to make a motion uh, at the end to postpone it to the first FinCom in April when Mr. Coppin will be here because I had some questions specific to him as well. Very good, That's Council. acceptable. Yep. Go ahead. That's acceptable. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good evening, Council. Thanks for being here tonight. You're welcome. So, Chief, you, this, this resolve was filed um, actually in regards to um, when Interim Chief Hayden was here and Mayor Coppin was here relative to code enforcement. And there was a representation, a promise made that night that if we, meaning the Council, approved additional overtime money that code enforcement was going to be reinstated immediately is what was said. Uh, it's my understanding that that hasn't happened. Um, that was almost two months ago. Um, so really what I'm looking to try to do in conjunction with my colleague, the chair, was, was to get um, a feeling from you as the police chief, um, Mayor Carpenter and his capacity, and then, and then some of the other individuals that were in, in, invited. Um, it was really because we, we thought, Dennis and I, the counselor and I thought that uh, code enforcement really falls into a couple different uh, categories as well. So could you just, Chief, could you just give us an update on what the current status is right now? The current status right now is we've assigned Sergeant Will Schleeman as a liaison to the Health Department. I've reached out to the Health Department and the Building Department 
and inquire to them what the needs from the police department is to those departments and whether or not they considered it to be a full-time job. Their answer to me was from the health department, it was just a matter of towing cars, uh, abandoned cars that they identify and have them removed from those properties. The building inspector, uh, Mr. Casieri, indicated to me that the need was primarily for um, when there was someone was going to be evicted or relocated, if they had to shut down a house, that they would need a police presence. Um, and I, my personal opinion is that it, we don't need to have a full-time police officer assigned to those. Now, now, Chief, and that's and, and that's your many years of experience in the Brockton PD, and I'm, I've never been a cop, so I couldn't tell you. But, but you know, Scott Ullman, when he was in that capacity, um, you know, it was more broad scope. That job was more broad scope. Um, you know, it sounds like the job now would be revised somewhat to deal with my, what I would call minor. I'm sure it's graffiti. I'm sure it's it's uh, trash violations, unregistered vehicles. But what about gar garages? Because even though garage licenses fall not under the license um, commission but falls under the city clerk, I know Allman was, was doing a lot of his work relative to that. And, and who's going to address that issue? As those issues come up, we'll address them. Um, but who, who will? The health department, the fire department, um, the building department. And if the need arises for the, a police response, we'll have one. So if there's... If there's you know, when we enact, you know, say it's Council Stadinsky, a uh, garage opens or a renewal of a garage is in Ward 4, and he puts stips on it, stipulations are on that license. If they're not abiding by those stips, you know, how, how is that going to be handled on a day-to-day -day basis? Because right now we know on the magnitude of the city of Brockton that every single day there is a violation in some fashion on garage license. There's no doubt in my mind. Everywhere. So, so how, John, how are we going to deal with that? Well, it's going to be a work in progress, and collectively, we're going to figure it out. I've talked to um, Mr. Kassiri. He has eight people assigned to code enforcement. I've talked to Mr. Tattaglia. He has seven. We have 13 people that are additionally licensed agents within the city for things under the License Commission. As problem areas, if a council is notified of a garage that they have a particular problem with, we'll address that. Yeah, I mean, I... And again, I would never step on any department head's toes. That's not our job. We're a legislative body. But I just, I have some reservations on that. I also, quite honestly, was somewhat offended because we, we were told, all of us were told, and even though maybe the word Scott Ullman will get his job back tomorrow was not stated, it was not, was not stated, and I concur with Mayor Carpenter, and that's why I want him to come before us. The representation made by Mr. Hayden, and it's not fair to you to do this, but you're the new chief, Mr. Hayden, and correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, Mr. Hayden made a representation to Council Denapoli that it would happen immediately. And literally, it's been two months. So, so what, what's the justification for the delay? The reason Chief Hayden didn't fill it is he'll have to answer that. I don't know that answer. Well, he never will because he doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that... Unless he's a consultant, Jay, I don't know. I do know that when I became Chief, I also came with the responsibility of allocating my resources where they are most needed. We're down 19 people, 11 vacancies, eight injuries. I need that full-time body on patrol, answering calls and protecting the city. And I'm not doubting that. I'm not doubting that at all. I mean, cr crime and, and public safety is, is really the linchpin for the city. But, but I guess what I could do, and I think I will in, in the next um, meeting we have, is to see Again, when, when Ullman was in that capacity, how many dollars via fines were generated in his term to see if it justified that position? Because I, w I would think it had to be tens and tens of thousands of dollars. I don't mean to interrupt, but I don't doubt that he did generate that. What I am saying is I can't afford that body to not be on patrol. But we really can't afford the city of Brockton to have code enforcement shorthanded. We can't. It's we're not, a major city. It's not that it's not being done. I'm not saying it's not being done. There's, 20, there's 26 people, including the license agents. That doesn't include the people the fire department have. Yeah. Um, if there's a police need, we'll address it. We're not going to not address it. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. And, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not finger pointing at you, you know, and I appreciate you being here. I, th I, think, I, I think I'm gonna hold <coughs> off and, and refer a lot of my questions to, to the mayor being the chief executive officer of the city, but, but at least we have this, and I didn't, is it Will Sheehan? Schleeman. Oh, Schleeman, okay, okay. See, I'm thinking of St. Patrick's Day, that's why I said Sheehan. <laughs> oh, Schleeman. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't have any other questions for you, and I thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, first off, congratulations. Great to see you here. Uh, I, and I just want to make one comment. I don't want to tell you where to put your men, and I, that's, I don't think the mayor should. I think that you should run your department the way you see fit. The only thing that I, I want to make a statement that I was very disappointed in Chief Hayden because his words were, and I never thought it would be Officer Allman again, but he told this council without fail, without, I will restore that position tomorrow. Yep. And that was how many members of this board voted right. on restoring that overtime money. And he stood there and there was not a blink. He said, if that's what I need to do to get your vote, counselors, I will restore that position tomorrow. He's no longer here, you are, and I'm not asking you to if you feel it's best to, you know, I want any department head to, to have the freedom to run his department. But I just wanted to comment for somebody that's no longer here, but I was very- the chair here. to my colleague in Ward 1. Oh, As you Sullivan. recall that night when Mr. Hayden said tomorrow, Subsequently, that same evening, we asked the mayor to come, and he reiterated that plea that it would be tomorrow as well. So it was both the chief and the mayor, Mr. Cruz. And again, uh, to me, it's the chief's decision to have made, and he made a, a, a statement. There was no equivocation. There was no question. I will restore that position tomorrow. And uh, just, I'm very disappointed in the fact that he said that to us and then never, never did, the, uh, did what he promised this, this board. So good luck to you. And again, I happen to think we do want that somebody there I understand your uh, manpower issues and I you know you're now our chief and to me you run the department the way you see fit but uh, it's just a statement and thank you very much thank you Councilor Cruz Councilor Barnes uh, yes chief okay if we can just kind of go back during that time the traffic a gentleman I think it was I think it's um, Tony Randolph and Dave Santos yes, okay so um, for the majority of the time they drive the, the big blacked out SUVs to enforce traffic and the trucks and all those other kind of weights and all, that, all those things. Were they were their duties reduced as well in the midst of all of that overtime? At the time they were, yes. Okay. Were they restored? Yes. Okay. So after after that hearing, after that happened, and, and um, Chief uh, former Chief Hayden made that declaration to the council. I heard it as well. I just want to concur with my veteran councils that I heard that as well. And. I, I'll go a little bit further to say that I think on that declaration, virtually alone, that that was the um, the meat behind the council voting for that extra couple hundred thousand dollars of overtime funds. Um, but what besides, I guess, you, your conversation with Board of Health and whomever else you spoke to, that you all determined that that position was not appropriate. What, is there anything else that's keeping that position from being reinstated when you just confirmed that two other, at least two other positions that were in that same jeopardy were fully reinstated? Why hasn't that one been reinstated? The two that were reinstated were the traffic and the Brockton Housing Authority offices. Those are the only two peop only people that were dedicated to those issues. The traffic unit was dedicated solely to traffic. Right. The housing authority units are dedicated to the housing authority buildings, um, and they were the only ones doing it. The code enforcement obligation is shared by many people. It's shared by the health department, it's shared by the fire department, it's shared by the building department, and our additional 13 license agents. So as a result of that, I felt that was the best place to reduce. Okay. Um Oh, okay, I, I, I don't want to, okay, my last thing. I, I don't want to disagree, but I kind of disagree because I went out actually with the mayor's um, stabilization home task force group with the BRA and um, with uh, some uh, Board of Health folks and uh, the Attorney General's office and some other people. And uh, Scott, he was the one that actually got us into the homes to see if there were squatters in there to be able to remove them uh, law lawfully he executed the warrants that we needed to get in there also with the locksmith so that we weren't you know entering someone's property illegally and to be able to have had that experience to go into those i think six or seven homes that morning 
they do that all the time. I just went the one time. They do that all the time to make sure that these uh, vacant and abandoned homes don't have any squatters in there. He's the only one that, or, or that position, let me put it that way, that position is the only one that is able to do that. And regardless of the, the amount of money that he brought in from you know, the violations and things that he caught, the, that the person in that position caught, those are quality of life things and those are, are other kinds of issues that we also need to take into account. And again, I, I, my colleague said that you know, we don't micro, micromanage um, d directors, but if it's just the opinion of, I guess, the, the group of people that this position, a full-time person in this position isn't necessary, I would like to suggest that that be something else that you discuss if you're going to open this argument back up again after these discussions and after uh, my colleague brings the mayor in to talk about this. So there are other pieces to that. Uh, am, am I making myself clear? I'm not sure if you're asking me a question or not. No, no, no. That last thing was a statement. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Any other councillors? Chairman. Councillor Studinsky. Hi, Mike. Chief, good evening. Good evening. Chief, I have two pieces of paper that I want to hand to you tonight for you to give to Bill Schleeman. 34 different locations. Most of them are at minimum operating with no license. They're making a mess of the Ward 4 area, making a mess of Ward 6 area, and other locations here. Could Bill, and I don't, I mean, you do it the way you want, but you named him. I would hope he would hand these out to the 13 agents and get them to go to these locations and square it away. Right, he is that I, liaison. I, I don't disagree with you. I, one man operation, you have far more than that you can do this. You can answer these calls. We much appreciate it, but I might be. Yes, sir. I don't want to one thing you want to say. Thank you. Yes, sir. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Chief. Councilor Sullivan. Chairman, uh, with that, first of all, I, I, I'm going to say that uh, I, I want to thank all my colleagues because, uh, quite honestly and quite frankly, we, we were deceived that night, blatantly deceived. Uh, and I hope that never happens again. Um, again, we decide appropriations, and uh, we have to think twice next time because of that deception, in my humble opinion. And I also think when you talk about Mr. Ullman, I mean, I dealt with him 10 years on the council. The guy took great pride in his job, really did. He might have ticked off some people because he, he, he went beyond, you know, the extra step. But that's what you need when you talk about a city. You know, we're not, we're not a country um, township. We're a city. So thank you, Chief, for having this individual, uh, Mr. Schleelin. I don't know him. I'm going to meet him. But thank you for that. And with that, Councilors, I'd like the mayor to come before us. I'm going to make a motion to postpone this resolve to the first thing calm in April. Second. 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 Motion's been made and seconded that this particular item will be postponed to the first FinCom in April. All in favor? All opposed? That's postponed to the first uh, FinCom in April. And on that, April. Mr. Chairman, we're not going to have to have Mr. Tatalia here or Mr. Kassiri. No, we could, um, we could just. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I think really may, the we'll mayor just, and if he would like the chief. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item number 11. Resolved that the mayor be requested to appropriate money for a study of the Brockton Police Department staffing span of control and to provide recommendations for reducing supervisory positions within the department, increasing patrol officers. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Police Chief. Uh, Mr. President, Council Mr. Stewart. Chairman, actually, I uh, filed this resolve and indicated to uh, the chief that he didn't need to stay because I would also like to have the mayor here as we have this conversation. Okay. I would like to note, however, um, that I had thought I sent the revisions uh, to this particular order. Um, and so the point here, and I just want uh, residents to know that in the city ordinances, we are by statute required to have six captains 12 lieutenants and 20 sergeants. And no matter the size of the police department, no matter what those layoffs could possibly look like, we're mandated to have at, at the top end of the force uh, these individuals that mm -hmm. are dictated by the city council, um, which doesn't seem like a wise way to have the city council mandate specific numbers uh, for the police department. And so, so the point of this uh, resolve is to have uh, a conversation around what is the best ratio of top brass to patrolmen, and that that should be fairly flexible depending on the size of the force. Um, but we can have that conversation when we have the mayor available. I'd like to have this postponed to the uh, next uh, finance meeting, please. Same, same, okay. okay. Second. 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 Motion's been on made. the motion. On the motion, Councilor Stewart. Chief, just a question. Do you have any money in your budget where you could pay for this? Is the mayor going to tell us that, that it'd be up to you to pay for it? Do you have any money? 
put aside. I'd have to check with the budget uh, captain Thank you. and see if there is a. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very counsel. much, Mr. Chairman. Motion's been made and seconded that this item also be postponed to our next FinCon meeting. All in favor of that? Opposed? That goes back to uh, full city council and we will uh, uh, postpone it. I'm sorry, that's postponed until the next FinCon meeting. Doesn't go back to council First yet. Time Question. Madam Clerk, right. you got that right. Item number 12, Madam right. Clerk. Ordinance. Resolved that the mayor, city solicitor, and the chief financial officer be invited to appear before a committee for this council to review the legal and financial implications of the city's contract with Aquaria. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, chief financial officer, Philip Nazarella, city solicitor, Moises Priorante, Aquaria Water, Rebecca McEnroe, PE project manager, Aquaria Water. Mr. Chairman, just just uh, just on that one moment, Councilor, because uh, Rebecca McEnroe also sent us a note today saying due to illness she was unable to attend tonight's meeting, so she's not present, nor is Moises, I believe. But Councilor Sullivan, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, again, I, I'm going to uh, make a motion to postpone. Again, Councilor Denapoli filed this. I signed on. You signed on on this. Um, but again, I just want to make it clear again, and we're going to address it on 13. The fact that Rebecca McEnroe wrote to the council via the clerk's office and the assessor's, uh, the, the uh, auditor's office today, this afternoon, again, is a slap in the face to this body. So I'm making a motion to postpone it. We're going to do that the second FinCon in April. Second. The motion been made in the second that this ought to be postponed to the second FinCon in April. Doesn't All in favor of that? Opposed? Postponed to the second FinCon meeting in April. Madam Clerk, item number 13. Resolved that the mayor and the city solicitor be invited to appear before the finance committee to discuss the existing contractual agreement with Aquaria and how to ensure communication from Aquaria to the city and the city council given the difficulty the city council has encountered in having an Aquaria representative appear before the council. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, Moises Pariente, Aquaria Water, Rebecca McEnroe, Project Manager, Aquaria Water. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan, again. Um, I filed this with my colleague, Councilor at Large Rodriguez, so I'll, I'll let him talk on it as well. But I am going to ask this be postponed. I'm also going to ask that we strike Mr. Parente and Ms. McEnroe as invited guests. The uh, intent of this resolve through myself and my colleague at large was to have the mayor and the city solicitor address this because it's a habitual habit. If we look back in time now, it's been three years since we had the original resolve, and the gentleman's only appeared uh, two or three times before this body. It's an absolute joke. Um, but with that being said, I will make a most po motion to postpone on the second FinCom in April with striking those two individuals, and I'll let my colleague say anything he wants to say. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, was there a second to the motion? Second. I was actually going to second that. <laughs> okay. All right. You second on the motion, Councillor. But I just wanted um, uh, to voice my uh, discontent as well with this whole uh, Aquaria issue. I, I wasn't on this council too long. I've only, I've only been here a year, but in the, in the year that I've been here, I think we've made numerous attempts to, um, to bring these individuals in just to give us minor, minor details of the operations of that plant of that, plant that we have talked so much about, including uh, some, uh, some language that was brought to us not too long ago in terms of purchasing a plant that we, we know absolutely nothing about. So I'm going to third that motion in terms of, uh, <laughs> of uh, postponing this, but I, I believe that uh, the end result, I believe, and I think I'm going to have actually a conversation with our silly solicitor and the, uh, the chief financial officer on the side just to try to get some information on this because I think until such time that this council decides to put its foot down and basically uh, let those that do business with this city know that this is a Plan B city where, I mean, it's interesting how we, you know, the, uh, the light company and the telephone company comes before this body just to install telephone poles. And yet we've got businesses that do millions and millions of dollars of business with the city that basically just takes this, work, this uh, uh, body for granted. And, and I believe that we as a, as a city itself, I, I understand that there's some uh, personal issues one way or the other that sometimes might have one, one individual uh, not going along with whatever the other individual is, uh, is suggesting. But what, what really counts here is what's at stake, and what's at stake is the well-being of the city of Brockton. And I believe that we, as the city of Brockton government, 
we owe it to the taxpayers of the city to basically do something about this. And to be honest with you, for a budget item that we've been spent, uh, basically kind of throwing away for the last um, seven years or so, six, seven years, in the amount of about six to seven million dollars now, I think to be disrespected the way we are currently being disrespected, it's something that this entire city government should be, uh, should take notice on. And with that, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna vote along with, the, with the, whatever the wishes of this council, but I think uh, until such time that we put our foot down, I don't think this is actually gonna stop. I know we have some, um, the budget season is about to begin, and I honestly believe that this body has to either put up or shut up. And, and if I think we're gonna take this city seriously into the next, uh, uh, where it needs to go, I think we need to start acting as the strong council and basically take what we need to do on behalf of the citizens of the city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. So the motion has been made and seconded that we also uh, postpone this to the next FinCon meeting. Second, the second, second, FinCon. second FinCon meeting in April. All in favor of that? Opposed? All, that goes to the second uh, FinCon meeting in April. Council, is any other? Uh, Chairman. Council Sullivan. You know, uh, Council O. Aneri, tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> so I want to wish everybody that's Irish and those that are Irish tomorrow a happy St. Patrick's Day here at City Hall. 10.30 tomorrow, we, uh, we hoist the flag. The mayor is going to have a little ceremony here. And then at noontime at the Council on Aging, Janice Fitzgerald and Michelle will have, uh, have an event for the seniors and the council courts will be singing or attempting to sing uh, that day. So I do wish everybody a, a happy St. Patrick's Day and uh, enjoy it and be safe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Councilor. It's probably easier if you just refer to me as Dennis O'Leary tomorrow. It's a little bit easier than O'Leary, but anyhow, it's Councilor like Cruz. A chairman, point of personal privilege. Just wanted to announce that I'll be hosting with yourself and Councilor Moynihan on Thursday, April 9th at West Junior High School, a meeting, a public meeting presentation uh, concerning the uh, proposed uh, casino. Where the proponents will make a presentation, public will be able to address questions, and uh, that'll be in the auditorium of West Junior High on April 9th at 6.30. 6.30. Thank you. Seven. Seven or 6.30? 7 p.m. 7 p.m., I'm sorry. 7 p.m. That's Thursday evening, April 9th, 2015, West Junior High School. That's- um, 6.45. Counts as Ward 1, 2, and 3. Excuse me, West Middle School. West Middle School, yes, we have to get and that. And while I'm too. mentioning West Middle School, I might mention that those of you that think the high school is old, it can't be, because Councilor Monaghan and I were there the other day it opened as freshmen, yeah. and uh, so there, clearly right. it can't be old. It's not too old. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, Councilor Cruz. Councilor Azak. A moment of personal privilege. Yes, you may, Councilor. Um, I'd like to announce uh, the date for Keep Brockton Beautiful. It's going to be Saturday, May 2nd, and um, I look forward to seeing everybody there, and hopefully my fellow counselors can get their own little groups and their awards, or at largest citywide, create a little group. We really want to make it the best um, Keep Brockton Beautiful this year. So if anybody has any questions, they can go on to the Brockton website. It, all the information's on there. Or if you don't have access to a computer, you can give me a call at 508-840-7957, and we can give you some information about how to join us on um, Saturday, May 2nd. And on another note, I'd like to wish my husband a happy birthday. So, yeah. oh, very good. Hey. Happy, happy, happy birthday to hey. Council Razak's husband. Very nice. <laughs> any other, any other uh, anything else before this council this evening? Seeing it done, meeting adjourned.